Welcome back, everybody. So this is basically the last lecture, and uh, this is going to be way out of left field compared to all of the material in the class that we've done so far. Um, so, but it should be kind of entertaining. Uh, basically, this is going to be a. I'm going to build up all of the relevant technological concepts necessary to uh, construct this idea of an autonomous artificial artist, which is this idea that I'm I'm very interested in, and it's going to be actually the basis for my next class. How many of you are taking uh, that class with me next semester? Okay, handful of you. Cool. So this is a little bit of a preview, at least the theoretical part of it. We're going to do, that class is going to be about more than just this, but this is going to be kind of at least an introduction to, to the technology. The first half of today is going to have almost literally nothing to do with what we've done this entire semester. So, um, so that's going to be, but, so I'm taking a liberty with that, let's say. But um, we're going to tie it all together in the second half where we're going to basically talk about how all of this affects machine learning in general uh, because uh, this is kind of an emerging intersection that a lot of people are interested in. There's a lot of really interesting new projects and initiatives in this space that I'd like to introduce you to because, um, well, they're just important to know about if you're interested in machine learning. And then, the, uh, and then this idea of the autonomous artist depends on really putting all of these things together. Um, so that's going to be um, basically today. Unlike all of the other lectures that we've done so far, there's going to be no tutorials today. So this is going to be the most useless to you also. Um, so forgive me for that. <laughs> um, so before we start, I just want to do a little, take care of a little bit of uh, admin stuff. So next week, it's all you guys. So I'm very excited. That's me. Uh, I'm going to be chowing down. Um, be, before next week, I'd, I'd like to maybe just hear from people what they're, what they're planning on doing for presentations. I'll have office hours, so just about office hours tomorrow, I'll basically just email me and I'll be here between more or less 12 and 5. I have to leave at 5 tomorrow, so, so just basically before that. Thursday, I'll be in here more or less all day, um, and, um, and same thing for Monday. For Friday, I'm, I'm going to Montreal for the weekend for, for a conference, but basically um, if anyone really needs to meet on Friday instead, I could probably come in in the morning, but otherwise I'm not planning on it. And uh, another thing to note is that we won't have any more AI labs. That last, uh, last Friday was the, was the last one, and we're going to restart that next, next uh, semester. So hopefully people are, people are uh, you know, in tune with that. We're going to be doing a lot of really cool new stuff in AI lab next semester because uh, Chris and I are working on getting a, uh, a new machine in here, which has a lot of GPU power, and we're going to try to make some, some like participatory use of it. So that's something to kind of look forward to. Um, yeah, and, and as I said last week, uh, if you want to, you, you can hand in your presentation late and not, pre not present next week. It's totally an option, um, which means you can give it to me either like electronically or you can, or you can come visit me at my office. And um, just a quick show of hands, how many people expect to show on Tuesday? Okay, most of you. If anyone doesn't want to, just please email me. Um, so, so yeah, um, that's, that's, that's all for admin. Are there any questions about that? Any, anything about presentations? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so let's get into the material for today. So the, the agenda is kind of like this. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to start by introducing sort of elements of, uh, of the decentralized web. So the, these many related initiatives, most of which are quite recent, uh, which aim to create some level of decentralization on the internet, whatever that means, right? We'll talk a little bit about what that means exactly. Um, we'll talk a lot about, um, and then we'll talk about certain aspects of it, right? We're going to talk a lot about how tokens can create interesting kinds of interactions, ways of interacting online. We're going to talk about this idea of crypto economics, which is a kind of a buzzword, but, but interesting term kind of going around. And then we'll talk about how decentralization affects machine learning, how you can do, how you can create machine learning models that are in a sense serverless or perhaps don't have any permanent base for their components, not the model, not the data, and so on. That's going to be later in the afternoon. And then we'll talk, we'll combine all this stuff into the, this idea of the autonomous artist. Um, and just a little bit of a taxonomy, like uh, hold calls. <laughs> Um, yeah, just a, a bit of a taxonomy, um, you know, the thing that most people are familiar with, of course, is like cryptocurrencies, but that's really just a big 
uh, that's really just a small part of the entire uh, conversation around decentralization, uh, as are blockchains, you know, because that's just one, let's say, data structure for uh, enabling some sort of consensus in a distributed fashion without any sort of, you know, intermediaries. Okay, um, now, be also, I want to I make this case for why these two things are actually re uh, are important to each other, because, of course, this class has been majorly about machine learning and AI, um, and it has not so much been, um, and we have not talked about decentralization, but these things actually have a lot more to do with each other than, than you may first, um, than, than may first seem apparent, right? And the case that I want to make is kind of tying these things together. So like, first, like, let's just at the highest level talk about what, what it is we mean by AI. So AI is kind of embedded in all of these, um, interesting applications that augment human intelligence, you know, so you can think of like the automation of things like self-driving cars and a lot of industrial applications and commerce. And then, um, more importantly for, or at least more relevantly to, to, uh, what we're talking about today, AI is also increasingly being, um, applied to the, uh, the sorting and the retrieval and, and the delivery of content, like online content. Um, because right now it's, we're entering this age where the scarce resource is human attention. So we really, really need a lot of, um, we need ways of being able to effectively deliver content where it's most relevant or applicable. And then, you know, things like personal assistance, this is also kind of relevant, right? We're talking about how we're going to be augmenting our own creativity. We're going to be augmenting our own, uh, presence, you know, in some, some manner of speaking. So that's kind of what I mean by AI or, you know, those, those aspects of it that we've been discussing in this class. And then decentralization is this idea of, at, at the broadest level, decentralization usually is kind of, we think of it as a means to an end. It's not really about not having um, some sort of a central authority. I mean, maybe for some people that's the most important part, but really what decentralization does, what it achieves is some form of very reliable automatic computation. Because uh, it turns out that when things are not decentralized, that they're easy to turn off. Um, and so this is kind of like uh, when you know that you have a, a very, very reliable computer. The, the, the metaphor that I often have in my own head is like I think of it as like there's some gigantic computer buried inside of the core of the earth. You know, and no one can touch it. But you can send programs there and you know it'll be executed. Mm -hmm. So think of it that way, right? And then also, we'll also talk about this much later. Um, there's everybody, like, it's going on. Sorry? Sorry? I, I'm sorry, what did you say? Decentralized computers, what do you think of as decentralization? No, decentralization I think of as like a computer that no one can touch that's buried in the core of the earth or in the mantle, let's say. You know, it's, it's very hard to get to. And, but you know you can send a, a program to it and it'll be executed. Um, and it's no small feat to actually make this work, um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works. Um, not that much, but, but a little bit. Um, mostly you can hold this metaphor in your head. At least it works for me anyway. And we'll talk about how, how this changes the, the way that people can govern themselves, and I don't mean government in uh, the specific sense of like, uh, you know, national governments, but governance in a, in a very more general sense. The way that we coordinate people together, how people can cooperate over shared goals. Um, we're going to see all sorts of interesting new techniques for doing that, that, that really are quite novel, like didn't exist before um, in, in basically human history. So, or, well, you know, that's probably roughly true if it turns out that way. Now, why are these things relevant to each other, right? So um, AI is relevant to decentralization because it provides intelligence, right? So a lot of the current conversation about decentralization is mostly about this notion of, of um, uh, the, 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 is mostly about transactional things, They're very sort of uh, simple things. Of course, Bitcoin is the most famous thing, and Bitcoin is the simplest possible application you can do in a decentralized manner. It's just, it's just memorizing a number associated with every account, which is the amount of money it has. Um, but, um, but we're going to talk about later, like more sophisticated things you can do with decentralized computation. And of course, sophistication is what AI is all about, creating uh, intelligence, creating um, planning, reasoning, like all of these things that might uh, enable computation to, to behave in a much more you know, rich manner, let's say. 
and uh, what does decentralization give AI? And this is the most underrated thing. I think this is, um, and I, I have a like a little theory that I'll that I'll share with you why why I think that that, that this is not spoken about that much. But but like you know when when people talk about AI, right? The the vision we have in their head is like of a robot that you can turn on or off, right? Um, but you know when when we think of like uh, humans or other intelligent beings. There's one quality uh, that they have that current AI kind of fails to capture, and it's this idea of autonomy. Um, all of us are autonomous beings. Like we control only our own actions, and we interact with each other. Of course, we interact with each other, and so we have an effect on each other. But ultimately, we're sort of autonomous. And I think that um, for something to truly be a sentient AI of sorts, it has to have this quality, in my view. And um, this is not really that big of a conversation in the AI space. And I, I think part of it is because decentralization is kind of such a, well, to, to some degree, it's an anathema to a lot of the, the uh, let's say, the companies or, you know, whoever mostly works with AI. But, but also because um, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Like, okay, the... Machine learning requires a ton of like computation data, and it just makes sense that it has to be centralized. It's much more efficient that way, and it always will be more efficient that way. Centralization is more efficient, but um, and so in, in some sense, decentralization feels like a something that actually uh, makes it more difficult to do machine learning, and it does probably. Uh, but the fact that we can do it means that we might have interesting new things that you can't really do with centralized machine learning. We'll talk about how decentralized machine learning might work in the second half of today. Um, so this, so then decentralized AI, what is that? That is, um, you know, last week we talked about reinforcement learning, the idea of agents that operate in the real world. Um, well, what if they also own themselves? You know, what if you have agents that operate in the real world that also own themselves, that take actions that are, uh, that are essentially autonomous, that even the authors of the software can't really exactly predict or or disrupt their activities. Um, this is kind of like what we might be headed towards. So it's a, it's a little bit like maybe I'm flailing my arms a little bit right now, but but it seems like at least the the technological pieces are are coming together to make this stuff realistic. Yeah. Uh, what are you, your thoughts on the ethical concerns of this? That's a huge topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we talk about <laughs> first like yeah. like what it actually right. is, and then maybe we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Yeah, um, and and to be honest, I, I I wouldn't consider myself like I don't do so much ethics. Like it's interesting to me. Um, like I of course ethics is a part of like everyone has an ethic, let's say. But I don't study it formally, so I don't know necessarily this will be the, exactly the right place to do it. Um, I, I've said this before with with respect to AI stuff in general. Uh, like one thing that I can be sure of is that when things are much more widely understood then uh, we're going to be in a better position to make ethical judgments about it, or at least in, in a democratic, you know, situation. Um, so that, uh, that, uh, that's kind of like my primary thing. I always fall back on that. Yeah. Um, and seeing as this is our last class discussion day, um, is, is, at any point, are we going to talk a little bit about Skynet? Yes. Yes, we will. Yeah, I think we will. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, and I just want to mention a few things that this is not about because decentralization is a huge topic and maybe some of you are Bitcoin fanatics and so on. Um, I don't really track or care so much about the price of Bitcoin. I don't, I don't own any. Like, I know it's fallen on hard times these days and I hope ever, no one's hurting too badly here. But, um, but the thing is that like, the technology is, itself is what I'm interested in because you know, it's a bit of a Pandora's box. Now that we know how to do these things, the knowledge of how to do them is not going to go away. Maybe Bitcoin will fail. Maybe it won't. It probably won't fail because it doesn't seem to be very good at failing. But um, but whatever the case may be, we will probably have, you know, blockchains and decentralized technology into the foreseeable future. I, uh, we're also not going to talk about, like, there's a huge landscape, of course, of, like, various projects in, the, in, the, in this space. And I, I'm not actually, like, personally invested in... in in really any of them. So we're not really going to talk too much about them, especially the ones that are kind of like legacy business models. And what I mean by that will become clear when we talk about, when we get into a future in the section later. And also it's important to understand that like we're dealing with 
very early stage technology. There's, there's a, you know, a lot of people make the analogy that blockchain is kind of like um, internet. You know, at some point there was in the 1990s, people were talking about what is the internet going to do? Oh my God, we can do pets.com. You know, who, who remembers that? Um, spectacular failure. Um, and, and I think we're in an early stage with the internet, but there's a big, uh, as we were with the, uh, we're in the early stages as we were with the internet in the 1990s. But there's actually a big difference, which is that now we also have an internet, and so the the hype is kind of like broadcast in a way that like was was unimaginable when the internet was in its infancy, and so there's a lot of like um, a lot of headlines and things that that kind of people get caught up in the current day to day of this field, and you know for and no you know of course if you're invested in it that's, there's good reason for that. But we, but it's really important to understand that, that technology is very, very primitive. It's like uh, most of it is doesn't scale very well. When we talk about the machine learning stuff, all of that stuff just doesn't even work yet. Like so, so. But but there's a lot of research going into it because there's a good, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, people believe that we 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 will be able to make them actually work on the practical level. Um, so. You know, in the 1990s, when you were listening to your modem squealing, you know, like, like, you know, and you couldn't use the telephone, you know, because, because does anyone even remember that? It's like, did you imagine that, you know, I'm going to have a video conference with somebody in Japan with like a three millisecond delay uh, in real time? Like, no, <laughs> no one really imagined that. Maybe, it, maybe some people, but um, it's, it's really hard to imagine what the future of the technology will be once it can actually perform. And I mean perform like actually do many things per second, like on the population uh, scale. Um, and the decentralization aspect of it is probably going to fizzle out. I'm, I'm a realist. Um, humans are, humans like when we conduct our societies, we, we sort of like balance centralization and decentralization because there is a kind of a twin danger um, and and benefits, right? And there's two sides of the same coin. Like, you you need some level of centralization to interfere with computation when it's necessary. And um, this is actually it goes against the entire idea of decentralization, right? But we wouldn't want, for example, um, like to not be able to interfere with something that's going to destroy the planet. And that's like, you know, Skynet, right? Um, so so probably we're we're going to you know, compromise on the, on the decentralization aspects, at least in terms of governance. Um, however, along the way, there's still going to be major consequences, like on the way that technology works. And so that's going to be, that's sort of, I'm not a, I'm not a utopian. We're not going to have like some libertarian, like a panacea or something like that. It's just going to be um, interesting new technologies, let's say. And I also, I love this quote from Paul Krugman, who said the, the Nobel Prize winning economist by 2005 or so, it will become clear that the internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machines. <laughs> yeah, so that was Paul Krugman, Krugman in like 1999 or something like that. So I'm not uh, 98, something like that. It was like the first dot com crash. Yeah, maybe just yeah. before the first dot com crash, something yeah. like that. So um, yeah, well, um, okay. Now uh, before we we're gonna move into peer to peer <laughs> networks, I want to do very 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 quick primer on cryptography because cryptography is kind of one of the building blocks. Uh, or is really the building, like almost everything in decentralization is built upon cryptography. And, um, or as I like to call it, the allegory of the lock and the safe. Or sorry, no, the safe and the mailbox. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, we, we're not going to go into any kind of depth of this. Obviously, it's like, uh, this is very low li level detail for us, so we're not going to talk about like the, the math behind it, let's say. It's very interesting stuff. I would highly recommend. Um, I can even like provide some... Um, good uh, reading materials. Uh, Bruce Schneier, I think, has the best book on cryptography. Uh, applied, I think it's called Applied Cryptography. Does anyone know the title of that book? Um, I forgot. I read it a long time ago. It's very, very good. It introduces all of this stuff in much more detail. So um, back in the day, um, in the, let's say, like pre-internet, 1950s, let's say, there, or World War II. Let's go back to World War II. The way of doing uh, encryption or cryptography uh, was using basically symmetric key cryptography. Uh, first of all, what is cryptography? Just in case anyone's not familiar with it, 
The idea of cryptography is it's a way of more or less scrambling and unscrambling messages um, so that they can be secret. Um, and of course, you can use cryptography to communicate across you know, dangerous territories, let's say, or untrusted territories. So that, that's kind of the main use case, although there's others as well. And the way that cryptography worked for, for a long time was that you know, there would be some sort of an algorithm which can scramble a message, and then, the, and then the same algorithm could be used to unscramble it. So let's say Bob wants to communicate with Alice and wants to send Alice a letter that says, Hello, Alice. Bob can encrypt it with a secret key that, that, that he and Alice are, are privy to. And the thing that it creates is called ciphertext, and it's basically unreadable, some junk, right? And then the same secret key can be used to decrypt it back to the original message. So if Bob and Alice both have this key, they or a copy of it, they can communicate securely, right? Now this worked really well during things like World War II, when the, let's say the British had to communicate with each other and the Germans had to communicate with each other. You agree in those keys in your home country and then you, know, you go into enemy battlefields and that's fine. But that doesn't really work very well on the internet, right? Um, oh, and, and this is the whole, the, the whole lo uh, safe analogy. So it's, it's kind of like a safe. Right? Basically, anyone who has the key can open the safe and put something in it. Anyone who has the key can open it and take something out of it. Right? So, so you can think of it as kind of like a safe. Um, now, uh, and, and I don't want to get into low-level detail, but like, okay, a really simple symmetric key encryption is like rotating the letters by 13. So A becomes N, B becomes O, and so on. Um, so you can use that kind of encryption, and then if you and I both know that, that you rotate the letters by 13, you can unrotate them and get the original message. Of course, this is trivial encryption. It would be broken in, any, you know, in milliseconds, basically, um, but, but that's an example. Right? Now, the problem is, of course, in the day of the Internet, uh, where we want to use cryptography, or, uh, uh, we want to use keys for a lot of things, encryption keys for a lot of things, um, it transmission is a problem. So like if we if you and I want to communicate be, uh, between the internet we have to agree to a key uh, in a secure way and it's, it's basically impossible to do that on the internet for, for various reasons. Um, it's, it's prone to things like man in the middle attack which is like let's say someone snoops on us and steals the key or copies it and then can stand in between us and, and basically read all of our communications. So symmetric key cryptography has is, is been known to be weak for, for this reason for a long time. So the solution was invented in the 1970s, I believe, and uh, with the first asymmetric key encryption, or as you might be familiar with, public key encryption. So what's public key encryption? Uh, the idea is now, compared to symmetric key encryption, there are two keys. There is a public key and a private key. The public key you are allowed to sh you can share with anybody. You can publish it globally; doesn't matter. Um, the the public key is allowed to be public, and then there's a private key which only one person has, right? And it's not like you and me are communicating online, and we have each other's private keys. It's not like that. You have your own private key, and the idea is that anything that is encrypted by the public key can only be decrypted by the private key, right? So these two keys work are, are, are um, complementary. You encrypt something with a public key and the public key cannot be used to decrypt it. It can only encrypt it. Um, I'll, I'll complicate that in a second, but, but like, okay, the public key encrypts it and then only the private key can decrypt what the public key encrypted. So that means that uh, we can use this um, as a way of communicating without exchanging keys. So I can publish my public key and any of you who want to communicate securely with me, you just have to look up my public key, write a message to me, encrypt it with my public key, and then send me the ciphertext. And then only I can decrypt it, right? It doesn't matter if anyone, if anyone uh, knows my public key or, or copies the ciphertext, they can't decrypt it without my private key. So this is a way that you can communicate without exchanging keys, right? Um, and only these two keys, they're always linked in this way. So it's kind of like a mailbox. Right? This is the whole safe versus mailbox. In the mailbox, anyone can put a message into the mailbox, but only the person with the key to the mailbox can open it. So that's the, the idea. Now, it turns out um, that uh, you can actually do two things with public and private keys. The keys are actually um, can be used in reverse as well. 
So in, in this, in the following sense, so the, on the left side is what we just talked about. You can communicate with public and private keys in this way. So you encrypt something with a public key and then only the private key can be used to decrypt it, right? But you can also do it the other way around. You can actually encrypt something with the private key and then only the public key can be used to decrypt it. So what would that be useful for? So that would be used for uh, signatures, basically. If you've ever heard of a digital signature, uh, it's a way of authenticating a message as I am the person who, who wrote this electronic message. Because here's the idea, if I write something like I will pay $500, I have a private key and I encrypt that, encrypt it and then I put it out there. And then anyone can verify with my public key that the message, that it, well, first of all, that the message isn't just junk, <laughs> but, um, but they can only, uh, all, th that can be used to verify uh, because anyone can take the public key and decrypt the message that I signed with my private key as a means of signature. And, you, and there's no way of making up the ciphertext um, in the, uh, to, uh, because it would take forever. And we'll see in just a moment when we talk about hashing, that's very similar. Uh, but basically, there's really, there's really no known way to do this. Uh, you can't, like if you wanted to figure out what ciphertext would it be that decrypts into a message that I want to forge, basically, it would be impossible, pretty much impossible, uh, because it's too difficult computationally to figure out. Um, if anyone's interested in the RSA algorithm, um, I, you, I think you can read about this in the Schneier book. We're not going to talk about it today, but but it, it's just for math for anyone who's in, interested in math. The the whole basis for this is based on actually a very simple principle. Um, the the algorithm is complicated, but the principle is simple. Um, we uh, if you take two very large prime numbers, um, and I mean like like several hundred digits long, and you multiply them together you get a very, very large number, right? Which has a prime factorization that has two very, uh, of two numbers, right? It turns out that there's basically no way of figuring out what those two numbers are if you don't know them in advance, except by guessing. And because they're hundreds of digits long, it would take a computer a million bazillion years to figure it out. So this is, this, this uh, mathematical, um, you know, like more or less hypothesis underpins all of modern public and private key cryptography. So, so, so some mathematician wants to come along and figure out a way to like actually deduce uh, very large prime numbers, um, then they could break all of cryptography in, in, the, in the day. Uh, it's very unlikely that, that it could be broken. There's very strong, like, um, get, well, it's, I, I don't know, I'm not privy to exactly why, but there's very strong guarantees that, that probably we have no way of figuring this out. Uh, because prime numbers are basically this really bizarre thing in, in math. They're like unpredictable. Their distribution is unpredictable. But anyway, um, what are some applications of public and private key cryptography? So I already mentioned communication. If you're familiar with PGP, uh, pretty good privacy is what it stands for. Um, it's, a, it's a public and private key crypt cryptography based email uh, protocol. So you can have a public key. If you've ever seen on someone's Twitter profile, like here's my public key or something like that, it's basically this. So you can grab, you can look up their public key and write to them a secure message and then they decrypt it more or less. That's PGP. Other applications like um, uh, SSL and TLS, so securing uh, HTTP, right? So if you're, so that's what HTTPS is. It's basically a way of, of uh, uh, both um, encrypting sensitive you know, information that's being streamed to you over a public Wi-Fi network, and also a way of, of verifying, um, there's DNS as well, if you're familiar with that. DNS is a way of verifying that a website is who they say they are. And both of those work on public and private key cryptography. There's a central uh, certificate authority that basically manages everyone's public and private keys, or sorry, their, their public keys, obviously. <laughs> Um, and, and this is actually like a little bit of a sore spot for the decentralization people because it's basically like one company um, called VeriSign that does, that does, um, that does, manages this. Um, also, for those of you who are familiar with Tor, the Onion Router is what it stands for. This also uses public and private key cryptography. Tor is a way of browsing the internet securely, so if you don't want to know, uh, you don't want your internet service provider to know what uh, websites you're browsing, you can, you can basically use the Tor network, which is this kind of peer-to-peer -peer network where you take a message like, I want to see, browse google.com, 
And what you do is you encrypt it in three layers of encryption using the public keys of three no nodes in the Tor network. And the idea is that it goes through this, this graph, like you send, let's say there's, um, uh, let's say there's three computers in, the, in between you and the computer that you want to ex exchange message, uh, information with. So then those three computers, they have public keys. So you take computer A, you take its public key, you encrypt your message, I want website google.com. Then you encrypt that message in, in, in uh, public key B, and then encrypt that in public key C. So there's three layers of encryption. And then you take that encrypted, that, that onion, as they, might call, as they use a metaphor, nice metaphor for, and you send it to computer A. And then computer A can decrypt the first layer, but they don't know what's in, all the way inside of it. They don't know what you're looking for. And, but they decrypt it, and then they send it to B. Then B doesn't know where the message originally came from anymore. They just know that they, gave, they got it from A, but they know that the message originally came from someone that they don't know anymore. They also don't know where it's going. They just know they can decrypt it with theirs and then send it to C. Now C actually sees where the message is going, but they, they have no idea who sent it. So basically you have this network where nobody simultaneously has all of the information necessary to tie you to the um, to the computer that you're or to the to the website that let, let's say that you want to browse so this is the way that Tor works um, VPNs also use public and private keys for for authentication and um, VPN is basically tunneling all of your internet browsing through some proxy is it's kind of like Tor um, except there's just one computer more or less that you trust um, so all of those things are examples of public and private key cryptography and the last cryptographic element that I want to mention is hashing. So hashing is, um, is basically a, a mathematical operation that takes any message and scrambles it into a hash string, which is unreadable. Um, and it's, it's, but it's one way. It's a one-way trapdoor, as we say. It, uh, basically, you can't unhash something. So I can take a message and hash it, and you get the hash string, and it's deterministic. It's always the same. So you hash ABC, you get... Uh, some unreadable hash string, and you hash it again, it's always the same. It's not random. It's, it looks random, but it's, it's actually deterministic. There are known algorithms. The most popular one is SHA-256. Um, uh, but the thing is, you can't reverse it. Like, basically, if I give you a hash value, and I, ask, and I tell you, what string would you have to hash to get this hash value, uh, you'd never be able to figure it out. You can only guess and you'd be guessing for a hundred bazillion years because basically it, it, it's that uh, hard to, to break. Um, so hashing is also very important. Why, um, why is hashing important? Well, be before we do, let, let's just mention one cool application of hashing, passwords, right? Um, so if you're logging into facebook.com uh, or whatever you know, website and you, there's some login, it would be very bad for them to store your password uh, in plain text to, to do like a, to compare it, right? Because first of all, it would be un insecure when you're transmitting the password to them through the form, but also because um, then all of their employees can get it and, you know, it's just insecure. So normally, competent websites, you know, of, of which there are very, very few, it turns out, um, store your passwords not in plain text, but actually as the hash of your password. Um, and then uh, to compare you at login time, they'll hash, you know, you'll, your, your browser will actually hash the password and then send it to them. And then they just compare whether their hash is the same as your hash and then they let you in if it is. Um, now, um, so notice like, okay, this is the hash for password, 5E88489. This is the most common, this is one of the most common passwords in, in um, there's a website you can actually look up uh, on. You can look up on Wikipedia the 100,000 most common passwords. I figured, I found this out a few days ago. 100,000 most common passwords, uh, and password is one of them. Of course, maybe some of you have used it in this room for 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 websites that you don't care about. Uh, but anyway, you'll notice that it's the same hash all the time. So um, if so, so it turns out that like if websites only stored the hash of your password then uh, they'd be like, uh, that would be insecure because it's prone to what's called a dictionary attack. We already have the hashes of the 100,000 most common passwords. And so all you have to do if you steal a password like lookup table is to just find if any of them, if any of the people were, you know, dumb enough to have <laughs> 
5e8848, you know, this, this exact hash, um, then you know their password is password, and, you know, so there you go. So normally what's, what's done actually by competent websites is something called salting, where we'll add, add some random string to the password, and that completely invalidates the whole dictionary attack idea. Where does that have to happen in the process in order for someone to figure it out once, they, once your database has been compromised? It's, uh, not, on the form side. it's not on the form side, I imagine. Uh, no. Uh, how is it actually done? I suppose maybe the... I might have been wrong about whether the browser actually hashes it. Someone might know this better than me. It might actually be done once it's on the server side, and then they'll, they'll have some algorithm for, for, uh, for, for salting it. But yeah, anyway, out of scope. Um, okay, one very important uh, uh, use case for hashing is something called proof of work. Uh, probably a lot of people, you know, if you're if you're even casually familiar with with Bitcoin and, and blockchain space, are familiar with this idea of proof of work, and it is a application of hashing, which is turns out to be very important. So the idea of proof of work is that you can use hashing to make someone prove that they that their computer has expended some energy to do something. Uh, here's the way it works. I ask you to produce a number such that when you when you hash it, the first 20 digits are zeros, right? Something like that, right? Now, now if I ask you to to give me the string that if you hash it's all zeros, that would be impossible because it would take too long. But something reasonable like okay, the first five, or the first 10 numbers, or the first 20 numbers are zeros then it turns out that you can make your computer just guess a whole bunch of strings until it arrives at one that happens to have the first five or ten digits of zeros. Um, but you can't do any better than guessing. So um, if you guess, it'll, it'll, you can expect that it'll take some variable amount of time um, to arrive at that. Now, um, so th this means that it, you have to, your computer has to expend some energy. Now, uh, why was this uh, done originally? Originally, the, the use case for this was preventing spam email. So the idea is that you can make an email service which requires somebody to, um, to put in the header of the email um, a, uh, basically a proof of work. So, so they have to find a, it's something like, like the idea is you take the header of the email and then you append a number to it such that its hash the first 20 digits are zeros or something. So basically your, your computer must expend you know, some amount of energy to, uh, to email. Now it, it might be trivial, it might be like it takes the computer one second or something like that. So it's a little bit of energy but who cares, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But the point is that if you're a spammer and you're trying to e uh, spam email a million people, then suddenly a mil it now it takes a million seconds to send spam email. So it's now it's actually a lot more expensive. Basically, it's expensive to send spam. So proof of work is a way of making computers like um, prove that they have just expended energy solving a basically a meaningless hash puzzle. Um, and that's and that's basically how Bitcoin is secured. And we'll get into that in a second. Um, Okay, but before we get into Bitcoin, let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer networks. So we, we've covered sort of the cryptographic building blocks. Now we can describe some of these, uh, some of these more interesting technologies. And um, you know, I have like 200 slides, and it's it's just it's really like it's completely too ambitious. We'll probably, we'll probably end up skipping some of the stuff, but but I, I'll talk about peer-to-peer -peer networks because it's very important. What is the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? And, and people are already probably familiar with certain peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? In principle, the idea is that you have a network of computers which are all interlinked to each other, and there's no central intermediary which, which happens to have any certain privileges, right? And peer-to-peer um, -peer networks are, uh, uh, don't have, they lack uh, central intermediary, right? So peer-to-peer -peer networks are not new. We've, we've ha we have lots of examples of them. Um, probably a lot of you are familiar with BitTorrent, right? BitTorrent has been around for a long time now. And BitTorrent is a protocol for people exchanging files on the peer-to-peer -peer network. And any, any software can implement the, the, uh, the BitTorrent protocol and be, become part of the network. And the protocol is completely public, right? So this means that uh, you, can, you can more or less guarantee that the BitTorrent protocol is going to survive even if any you know, particular 
element, uh, you know, pieces are around it. Let's say, let's say a particular, like, let's say BitTorrent Incorporated, right? Which there, there is actually a, a company called BitTorrent, which makes a piece, which makes some software for Bit, you know, to, to interface with the BitTorrent network. But if they went offline tomorrow, then the BitTorrent protocol still exists, and so does the network, right? So there's trackers and there's developers and all there's all these pieces that nobody can really you know once the protocol exists then there's no way really to eradicate it right and um, actually Napster was like this too except Napster was not decentralized exactly it was like a piece of software you can download from one server um, and who remembers Napster right remember back in the day where you know, you would you would go to school and like maybe maybe when you come back like you would have downloaded a five megabyte MP3, um, maybe. <laughs> um, so <coughs> other decentralized networks, other peer-to-peer -peer networks rather. Um, Diaspora. Anyone familiar with Diaspora? Diaspora was a project in the early days of Facebook to try to make a basically a peer-to-peer -peer version of Facebook. Never really really took off. Um, and and when we when we start to talk about some of these token games, we'll, we might discuss why. Um, but that's an example. And then also um, there's uh, things like uh, Mastodon. So if some people are familiar with Mastodon, it's not exactly um, not exactly decentralized. It, it, it's more federated, as it says. Uh, but it's basically but it is a protocol. So Mastodon is basically a protocol. It's an open source software that implements something like Twitter, basically. And then anybody can create a Mastodon node implementing the software and then host a, a sort of like a, a, a Twitter-like community that can interlink with the, with the wider network. So that's, that's the idea of Mastodon. Um, it turns out that like half of the Mastodon network is under one, is under one node anyway. So, so I don't know if it ends up functioning all that differently than Twitter, but, but it's a step in that direction anyway. Um, as, as so long as the protocol is out there, anyone can implement it, right? Um, no one could just make a copy of Twitter because you don't have their graph. So um, that's, that's a big difference. And then there's things like Freifunk. This is more relevant to, to Germany, where I had this slide. I made this slide in Germany. Uh, but basically, there's a peer-to-peer -peer network of, of a wireless internet, like a wireless internet sharing you know, mesh network, basically. So these are all examples of peer-to-peer -peer networks. They've been around for a long time. And really, like the original internet was supposed to be something like a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? What happened was that in the 1960s, we began to develop the technology to have computers uh, communicate with each other over landlines, over, over you know, fiber optics, or maybe fiber optics came later. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody knows that better than me. But the idea was that computers could communicate with each other. And there were all of these different uh, proprietary systems for doing that. So the military had its own system for having the computers on its network communicate with each other. And maybe universities had something else. And basically, like... There was this whole, there was a whole bunch of computer networks, right? And then along came a generation of people that were, were kind of saying like, maybe we could create some sort of a protocol. Um, and, and what we mean by protocol is it's a public standard of how computers can be made to communicate. And if everyone implements this standard, they will all be able to communicate with each other. We'll have a network communicating, uh, a network tying in networks, right? A, a, a network of networks, right? And that, that was basically the genesis of the modern internet. So there were all of these protocols invented uh, that you're probably already familiar with. Of course, like everyone knows what everyone, you may not know exactly what it is, but of course you're familiar with HTTP, TCP, right? IP, um, SSL, TLS, like SMTP, which is email. Like all of these were our public standards that are um, that are not owned by any single uh, anybody essentially. Now there are like sort of governing bodies that that exist that have some that have influence on how the protocols are evolved. But the protocols are very conservative. They they actually really don't change, uh, which is in fact the problem. <laughs> uh, but in any case, like the 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 fact that they, well, it's a problem in some ways, but it's also a good it's a good thing too, because okay, compare SMTP right. That's the email protocol. Um, there's a protocol for, uh, for email, right? Um, and email, despite the fact that it's, that it's almost entirely obsolete now, uh, still exists today. And that's actually a testament to the resiliency of the protocol. Uh, because anyone know, if, they want to, if you want to create a, uh, something you know, like a, uh, a company built upon some, providing some internet service, 
um, it would be really, really wise to do it on top of a public standard uh, because then you know that it's going to be there in five years. Um, if you want to build something on top of proprietary standards, uh, it may, uh, you know, at the whim of the company that's th that is running the proprietary software, it may cease to exist in a few years, right? Um, how many people remember like the, the like three seconds that Spotify had an API? Um, or, or that even Facebook, Facebook had an API. People were building Facebook apps. That was supposed to be their whole business model. It existed for all of a year or something like that. And so it can be really, really hard to develop applications on top of other people's, pro, uh, other people's software, um, on top of private software, basically, because you really, like the ground may shake beneath your feet and then your company is gone. Um, but not so for things that are built on top of the original internet protocols, right? So that's kind of the, the virtue of protocols. They, um, now, the fact that they don't change, though, means uh, it is also a weakness because then they don't adapt to new technology. So then Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of them come along and they make their own messaging platforms, uh, which are more modern and you know, arguably superior technologically um, to, to good old email. And so that's why email sort of, sort of starts to go obsolete. And now all of our communications are actually like on private channels. So, okay, well, that's, that's kind of like a microcosm of the internet. Um, now, um, in, in all their, despite all their wiseness, the, the, the builders of the internet could not really foresee what would happen, you know, 20 years later, which is that this server client model that they built, that they built, uh, they were like, okay, this is kind of like a good way of, you know, I mean, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network and maybe like the server has certain privileges, but there's really no way around it. It's like you have to have content in one computer, it has to be shared into another computer. Maybe this is kind of the best that we can do. And of course, what they didn't anticipate was that some of those servers would grow to be the size of, of the biggest companies in the world, right? So the decentralized internet slowly became more and more centralized as more and more of the services that we use on it are actually inside of all gardens, right? So, um, and of course, you're familiar with all of these companies. Um, obviously, like, they're all ma massive and, and, and they, they have their own internal architecture and software. You know, they implement the basic protocols, but then inside of their server, it's all custom, right? And that's kind of where we are with the internet today. So, what are some problems with the internet today? What are some problems of you know, the, the way it has been built now? Well, there's a few of them, right? And, and this I'm kind of pulling from the, the generic IPFS slide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you IPFS in a second, which is a really cool idea. So the web is slow uh, and inefficient. So suppose all of us are accessing Facebook or, or something like that. Um, I go to facebook.com and I download some photos from it. And then, um, you know, like uh, Jenna wants to download the same photos, right? So she puts a request and it goes all the way to Facebook and then it comes all the way back to her, you know, maybe halfway across the country basically through a whole bunch of hops. It's really, really a lot of like uh, wasted energy when, when she could have just gotten the photos from me and my computer's right next to her. We're in the same local network, right? So um, the web, the web is, is inefficient at content delivery, right? And um, the, the Juan Benet, who's the creator of IPFS, which I'll show in a second, he talks about um, the most popular video on YouTube, or at least that was the most popular video on YouTube, was Gangnam Style, right? So um, the, the, and it, it had been streamed on YouTube like two billion times. So, so that's two billion streams of high definition video from one company, like, like if all of us, you know, like of course it's very popular, so maybe all of us were watching it on the same day on the same floor. It's like we're, we re-download the same, same like 500 megabyte video, maybe it's a little bit less than that, but like a lot, right, uh, in, this, in this manner. So it's kind of inefficient in moving around content. Uh, the web is also unreliable. It, it, it's impermanent, right? Um, content can be taken offline. I, I mean, of course, like there's good reasons for that, but... But, the, but even when someone just renames a file, all of the links to it break, hyperlinks break, right? Um, then it's unverifiable and insecure. You know, everyone knows what a nightmare cybersecurity is. Um, and, then, uh, and then this is the more important, most important aspect is the data, power over data. So there was never really any um, protocol developed to handle data. So data, and I mean like social data and user data, things like that. 
And so data was has always pretty much been a proprietary standard. Facebook has their own data about you. Twitter has their own data about you. All these companies have their own data silos, and they're very, very valuable, and they're private. And those companies will never, ever share them. Uh, because basically their entire business model is, is built upon more or less charging rent over top of that data. Um, and we'll talk about the mechanics of that in, the, in a little bit, but that's the, that's, and, and then of course there's a huge, huge issue because, okay, let's say you're a content creator and, you know, you're, you're putting stuff on some platform. It's like, you can't be sure if that company won't decide to go offline tomorrow or to, to get rid of that service because it's unprofitable. And a lot of the work that you put into maintaining that may disappear overnight. Um, how many people remember GeoCities? Anyone make a website on GeoCities? Hollywood lot 6641 over here. Um, that went offline like uh, a couple of years ago because I think Yahoo bought it and they were like, well, this is useless. So gone. Um, so that's, that's not great, right? Um, so maybe we can fix this, right? Maybe we can have a different um, uh, architecture to the internet. And there's a number of projects in the space. There's a lot of people talking about this. So this is just one that I've choos chosen to, to share with you, the one that I'm most familiar with. But there's a, an open source initiative called IPFS, Interplanetary File System, that is very, very ambitious. It wants to completely rebuild the internet. And I mean rebuild the internet like, like no more HTTP, no more SMTP, like completely change the, peer, uh, change the internet into a peer-to-peer -peer one. And uh, the idea of IPFS, and let's just see how we're doing in time. I, I probably won't go into um, like all of the specifics because just in the service of time, but I'll just mention a few of the top level points about IPFS. It's an, so basically this, the server client model where servers give you know, data to clients is swapped with a peer-to-peer -peer network where all of the nodes uh, are essentially capable of being both server and client, right? And um, when you um, uh, the, like when when you put content on the on the uh, network, anyone who accesses that content keeps a cached version of it, and so they can serve it later. It's something like a BitTorrent for the internet. Imagine if, if imagine if your web browser were something like BitTorrent. Whenever you access a website, it's downloaded from multiple nodes, and nodes happen to be the ones that are closest to you. Let's say. Um, so you can effectively try to decentralize the, the storage of the data um, so that there's not one central server. Um, and, and then also there's aspects to it that try to put the content creators m in much more control. So, um, and, and I won't talk about that aspect of it because it, it overlaps a lot with the decentralized machine learning stuff, which we'll get into. Uh, but, but that's also an IPFS uh, concern. And then security is also very, very strong in IPFS. Um, I'll just give you two basic things about IPFS that are worth knowing that build upon some of the things that we already mentioned. Um, this idea of Merkle trees and Merkle dags, these are cryptographic structures. We don't have enough time to talk, talk about them, but, um, but basically Merkle dags are essentially how GitHub works. So um, if you ever use GitHub, you, uh, you know that code changes are actually saved as, di as, as, half, like, as diffs and, and the hashes of those become their address. Um, so um, you can basically create a content version, uh, a version history of, an in, of the internet, essentially. And uh, what's really cool about this is that instead of having a content or a location address, so you know you open up a website and you go http.com slash facebook.com slash whatever, and it's, it, it, it's associated with some particular server. Instead, the content address of any piece of content uh, no matter who's hosting it, it's hosted by multiple people, but it has the same address, and the ha address is its own hash. So you take a hash of the content, and that becomes its address. And the reason why this is great is because it basically means that you can verify that the content that you're receiving is, is what's associated with the address. And so maybe you have a mechanism for reputation, let's say, associated with a particular address, and then if it has a high reputation, and the content that you're downloading from it, its hash matches the address, you know that it's probably safe, it's secure, right? Um, you can create something like on the web today, which is, uh, you know, looks very efficient, but you can swap out the content uh, to something malicious whenever you want. Um, and there's really no way of, there's no way built into the protocol of verifying it. 
Um, so this is kind of like put cybersecurity front and center. So IPFS is a really cool project. Um, this is a little bit about the stack, but I would, I would definitely like look into that if you're interested in a decentralized internet. So now let's get into like Bitcoin and blockchains and all that stuff. So electronic cash is the thing where is is the sort of like idea that preceded Bitcoin, right? And uh, people have been talking about it since since even before the internet, really. Um, there was things like uh, DigiCash and eCash. You can look up these projects. They were sort of projects that tried to use some uh, elements of encryption to create uh, like secure currencies that were not issued by a state, right? Um, and um, Nick Zabo, who's a really interesting writer in this space, he, he first talked about this idea of bit gold in 1998. A lot of people think Nick Zabo came up with Bitor, uh, not Bitor, Bitcoin. Uh, he, uh, he probably didn't, but, but I don't know. But, but basically, he was, he's one of the early pioneers in this space. Uh, as Hal Finney, like, these are all sort of some of the sort of like, um, like uh, ideas that intersect a lot with, with Bitcoin. Uh, but but none of them could quite solve a major problem that Bitcoin did, um, and so that's why they didn't really work at that time. Um, so, but you can look these up if you're interested in the history. So, Bitcoin was released as a paper uh, and a, and a basic piece of software by an anonymous person named Satoshi Nakamoto, rough exactly almost exactly ten years ago today, um, and the um, the idea of Bitcoin was okay. You have this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, you know, m money that you can exchange, which is, and the network is monitored by the, by the participants, and there's no central issuer of that currency, and it uses cryptography to se secure it, and it solves a major problem, which, which we're actually going to see in the process of this, this protocol. Um, I'm, let's see, it's 1.10, we have 12.10. I think what I'll do is I'll go through the Bitcoin thing very quickly, uh, I think we're, we're still making okay time, but I, I'm not going to talk about the, it's a little bit of, again, like I don't want to go into too much low level detail. It's a little bit out of scope for us uh, because we really want to get into serverless machine learning and all this stuff that's more relevant to the class. But of course this stuff is interesting. So, so it's, it's worth putting in a few minutes into it. So how does the normal bank work? Uh, Mr. Monopoly man um, basically tends to a bank and the bank um, is secured. How is the bank secured? Um, it's secured by the force of the state, right? So there's like an invisible team of like people with very large weapons that are ready to uh, enforce any sort of like bad behavior, uh, or at least bad behavior that they don't like, um, of course. Um, now, so how does it work? Like, okay, let's say there's a people making tra transactions to the bank, they send checks to it, the bank has a central ledger that they keep track of, and you know, people put in transactions and they keep track of them. Okay, this is straightforward enough. They can monitor if someone tried to spend the same money twice. Um, they can monitor if someone uh, tries to write a check with uh, for money that they don't have, and so on. Now, what if we want to get rid of Mr. Monopoly Man? Because maybe you know, maybe we don't like Mr. Monopoly Man. Um, maybe, maybe uh, he likes to sometimes like print a whole bunch of extra money and give it to his friends. You know, because his friends ran out of money. You know. Not like that's ever happened, uh, or maybe maybe um, maybe Mr. Monopoly Man, um, maybe he doesn't like one of maybe he doesn't like Alice. You know, he's looking at Alice. Maybe maybe because Alice is publishing like secrets about Mr. Monopoly Man's friends that Mr. Monopoly Man doesn't really like. Maybe she's running a service called Tricky Leaks, and so um, Mr. Monopoly Man decides to freeze her account. So maybe we don't like some of these behaviors. And then this is kind of the spirit of Bitcoin, of course. It's like um, the, the uh, original spirit of Bitcoin is really like this streak that the, the central issuer of money is, is usually corrupt. And, and, and you know, maybe there's some evidence for that. Who knows? But in any case, like, the idea is that um, in order to have a decentralized bank, we all have to keep track of the ledger together, which means something really, really hard, which means we all have to agree on what the ledger is. And we have to do so in such a way that requires none of us to trust each other. Right? So that's really hard. Um, and, um, and you can kind of get almost all of the way there with, with technology from 30 years ago. And here's how it would work until we run into a major problem. Um, here's how it would work. So, you know, you broadcast to the network, Francisca is sending Gabriella some money. 
uh, and so on. But now we run into the first problem, which is forgery, right? So if Francisca sends Gabriella money, why not Gabriella just says, hey, Francisca sending me some money, she transmits to the network, and everyone everyone agrees that Francisca sent Gabriella money except for Francisca, right? So how do we uh, solve this problem? That's pretty easy, actually. You use digital signatures, right? So here's the idea is that any transaction has to be signed by the private key of the person sending money, okay? So that's the first problem to solve. Okay, so we're going along, our bank is doing pretty fine. Second problem, copying the signature, right? So you can make a transaction, but then I can take, the, take that transaction. Like, let's say you sent me some money. I can make 10 copies of that, that transaction and flood the network, and then you send me 10 times that money, right? So that's the second problem, also easy to solve. You put in a, um, so, oh, oops, that, that's actually, it shouldn't say solution consensus on the order view. That's, that's something else, sorry. It should say solution is transaction ID. So now there's an ID, so, so only every transaction can only be signed once, basically. Um, okay, so that's working fine. Here's the critical problem that, that Nick Zabo and Hal Finney and, and everyone in the 90s and 2000s could not solve. Uh, and, and it's known as the double spending problem, but that's actually just a, a special case of a more general problem, which is how do you agree on the order of transactions? And that's really important because if you cannot agree on the order of transactions, then you cannot know whether one is valid, basically, because if you have $4 in your account and you try to send those $4 to two people at the same time, then maybe half the network thinks that transaction A came through and half the network thinks that transaction B came through first and um, which one is valid, right? So this is actually a big problem. Now, um, you might think of a naive way to solve that problem, which is through voting, right? So you can go, okay, we can reach consensus by voting. Everyone has to say which of the uh, transactions came first, and you know, if, if more people said transaction A came first, then transaction B is thrown out, right? Uh, but the problem with that is that, that it's prone to what's called a Sybil attack, which means that anyone can just like make a million fake accounts and uh, and use that to to um, to game the order of transactions, right? So the solution, uh, and, and actually there's two problems now, and it, it, what's great is that these two problems are turned against each other. We're gonna we're gonna solve two problems with one stone. So the idea is you need consensus on transaction order, so that's one problem. And then there's a second problem which I didn't even mention, which is where does the money even come from? If there's no central issuer, where does it come from? How does how do people start with Bitcoin, right? And the solution is, uh, well, okay, so well, there's one solution, of course, is this, right? But we're we're not going to use the old solution. We're going to use a new solution, which is that you reward the nodes on the on the network for cooperating to achieve consensus, to to actually agree. So if you agree you get money, and it turns out that that money is in fact how you get money into the network to begin with. So this is how Bitcoin basically works, is that some of the people in the network, not all of them, have very, very strong computers. Um, and it didn't used to be that they had to be that strong, but now they have to be like gigantically strong. Uh, hash power, as, it's, as we call it. And the idea is that um, the these uh, all of these people, right, or, or entities or whatever, um, are responsible for, um, uh, are basically responsible for verifying transactions. And what they do is there's a pool of pending transactions that are constantly being streamed to the network by people sending each other money. And from that pool, each of these miners, as they're called, will grab a, a set of transactions, more or less randomly, you know, they, yeah. Wait, miners, not, not like children? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Miners, like, like in the Bitcoin sense, uh, not, not, yeah, not, not miners, miners, not miners. Um, so the miners, they are, um, they uh, take a pool of transactions, and they put it into what's called a block, right? And they're trying to put that block. They're trying to verify that block. And what they have to do is th there's a previous block, and they will take, and that previous block has an ID, has a hash string associated with it. And they have to take their block of transactions and a not, what's called a nonce, which is just a random string, basically. And they have to find the nonce such that when you place it together with the transactions into a block and you hash it, 
its hash uh, does uh, has some proof of work, which which is basically uh, it, the first however many digits are leading zeros. I think that's the way Bitcoin does it. It's like leading zeros, I think. And how many leading zeros is calibrated by the network so that it it, it, it roughly expects that it'll take 10 minutes for some somewhere, someone around the world to find some random number nonce that when their, when their block is hashed, it has that many, um, that many leading zeros. And the, the critical thing is that it has a, it's tied to the previous block through the, the hash. So you can't just, you can't just attach it anywhere you want. Um, it, it, this process is hard. It takes, a, it takes a lot of computational power. Like you can't just do it on your computer. It would take too long. Um, but, uh, but the idea is that if you do this, the software will create some money for you in, in verifying that transaction and give it to you. So that's, that's your incentive is for hashing this block. And then the block gets attached to the previous block. And then you have what's called a block chain, right? That's the, yeah. So it, are, are you saying that the, um, the, the way that transactions are verified inherently is baking into the system uh, inflation or the, the continuous devaluation of the currency? Uh, yes, but, but uh, uh, to a known degree. So, uh, so with Bitcoin, for example, uh, and, and every network is different, but Bitcoin, it's known that there will be 21 million Bitcoins and that's it. So you know exactly how much there will be in some amount of years. But the but the money is still being put into the system. So what happens when we re when that amount of uh, Bitcoin has been completely distributed? Then uh, the only then it will work with just transaction fees. But we don't want to get too deep into Bitcoin. Like um, just the I, I, the only the if you didn't understand the protocol, like it's not important. What's important is this this idea that we can create this sort of like computational game that forces us to achieve consensus. And the reason why it forces us to achieve consensus, if you think about it more abstractly, is that everyone has money riding on it, right? Because the network, the value of Bitcoin, hedges on the security of the network. And so um, we have to, we essentially all have something to lose if we don't coordinate. So, so it creates this sort of like slow moving coordination of many, many people. Um, using cryptography and that's that's kind of like the, the the basis for all this so that's bitcoin now uh there's lots of other cryptocurrencies in the cryptocurrency c and many of them are just based on bitcoin some of them are more privacy or anonymity focused and so on there's a lot of different cryptocurrencies we're not really going to talk about them um but um but obviously the cat's out of the bag you know there's this this idea that you can create you can that anyone anyone can create a cryptocurrency uh, it, any of you can create a cryptocurrency associated with you, right? Uh, Aiden coin, you know, so like the, you, you can do that if you want. And, and the thing is like, okay, maybe no one's going to care about Aiden coin initially. Yeah. No, 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 just until you, you know, hear me out, you know, you, until you do something interesting with it, right? Because, you know, anyone can create one. That's the problem. It's like, who cares, right? But the thing is that the, the point is that one thing that you can do now that you couldn't do before is that you can guarantee its integrity without you enforcing it. Like you, you, don't have, you can just put it on the blockchain and, and you know that the, whatever rules you set out for it, it can be guaranteed by the integrity of the blockchain. And if you happen to make some really cool rules, then maybe actually some people will start trading it. Um, in the future, like everyone may have their own cryptocurrency. Like that's no joke. Um, or not, not cryptocurrency, but token, which is kind of a generalization of this idea, but we'll get into tokens in a second. Okay. So uh, just because we're, let's see, we're, we're getting really, I'll go for another 10 minutes and then we'll take a break. Um, we'll, we'll, we're, we're making decent time. I know I'm going fast because like this is, I originally did this in a six hour session. So, <laughs> so I had to like really scrunch things up, but I'm well practiced. So, so. <laughs> anyway, um, in, uh, so Bitcoin was kind of like in 2009 was this like, was it was something that was basically known. You can actually go to the Cypherpunks mailing list where it was announced, and, and it's, it's always fun to do this. Like, you look up this, you know, the Cypherpunks mailing list is just this random mailing list of people who are interested in cryptography. And, you know, some random person put a, a, a post there in, like, the beginning of 2009 that was, um, it's like, I've come up with this electronic currency. And there's, you know, there's, like, 20 replies on it or something like that. First replies like, oh, this is kind of interesting. It just seems so like it seems so innocuous, 
and who knew that it would spawn like a hundred billion dollar market cap, like uh, or what is it? Yeah, hundred million dollar market cap, billion or million? <laughs> I forgot. Uh, no, hundred billion. Yeah, spawn a huge, huge uh, market cap, like in the in the future, um, and it's all online. It's just in public records and public domain. Um, of course, if you had been around in those early days, like anyone could have mined cryptocurrency, you could have mined like like a hundred bitcoins, like in your, with your laptop, like on the first day, uh, because there was literally like ten people who were interested in it. So wouldn't that have been a great idea? Um, so, <laughs> but anyway, um, but for for everyone else who missed it, um, that it kind of was was pretty much under the radar for for the first two or three years. So like for a couple of years, it was kind of this. Um, this thing that just people were like just trading bitcoins with each other. It was pretty much worthless. It was maybe like a few cents or something like that. It started to become more uh, known in 2011, I think, maybe late 2010, 2011. And at that time, it started uh, a bigger group of people had begun to coalesce around it. And people and other technologists started to think about other things that they could do with this idea. And so there was kind of this phase of second generation applications that we're trying to extend the functionality of either Bitcoin or the sort of underlying idea of a blockchain. And uh, one quick thing that people started doing was they started to experiment with this idea of tokens. That you can, uh, that you can um, take some, let's say a real world asset, you know, a real world asset, a stock or a bond or a coupon or you know, ownership of something, and attach it, like bound, bind it to some uh, basically some cryptocurrency or something on the blockchain, right? A message that you can transact. Um, so this, this was kind of like pretty interesting people there. Like now what you can kind of do is you can, you can think of the blockchain not as just something for uh, managing Bitcoin or currency in general, but something for doing computation or, or, or like outsourcing security essentially, like ownership of, of uh, various assets, right? You can do something as simple as have your own movie theater and distribute tickets on the blockchain, then you don't have to deal with the security of it anymore, right? So start, people started thinking of it that way. And um, a lot of people also started thinking about other things they could do with a blockchain, like putting other kinds of data on it. So for example, Namecoin came along and that was supposed to be a decentralized uh, DNS server because uh, it turns out the DNS is, is still the fastest way of doing internet censorship in the world. And so, um, and so Namecoin was like, well, what if we what if one company isn't doing DNS, like managing domain names? Maybe, maybe you can actually make a blockchain for this. And um, there's also people started thinking about like other uses of, of these tokens. Like, okay, maybe you can distribute tokens for voting systems. Maybe uh, tokens can be used to distribute things for like a, a universal basic income type schemes. Um, other people started thinking about its use for, for provenance. And provenance is the idea of like verifying steps along the supply chain. Um, IP rights became became a thing. So like all of these ideas, like attaching data onto a blockchain and telling and knowing that you can you can basically put strong guarantees on its integrity. Um, and um, and that was kind of like the next couple of years of of, of this space. You know, 2011, 2012, 2013. Now um, alongside this development. Uh, there has been this idea of a smart contract floating around since the 1990s, and that this was the term was coined by Nick Szabo. Um, again, you've already heard his name. He's a, he's a really really interesting. Uh, like he has a very interesting blog. A lot of a uh, lot of uh, like you know think came up with a lot of this terminology. And a, a smart contract. The idea of a smart contract, and it's kind of independent of blockchain. Like it's not. It, it can be its own thing. But the idea is that it's a software based self-executing financial contract. So contracts, how do contracts enforced, right? They're, first of all, they're written on paper, signed with a pen. They're obviously like, ceremony, the, the actual documents are ceremonial. The reason why the contracts are legitimate is because they're enforced by the state, right? That's, that's basically how they work. And so, um, and by the state who has a monopoly on the use of force, right? But what if you could create contracts which essentially um, can guarantee their execution uh, because they're software and, and you can't stop them from executing, right? Um, and, and actually, like the analogy he used, I think is quite good. He compared it to a vending machine. So a vending machine is kind of like a, the physical manifestation of a smart contract. The idea is that it has a piece of software and the vending machine has a, so a software inside of it. That It's very simple software. It goes, you put in some money, I give you a snack. 
If you do not put in money, I do not give you a snack. If you um, put in not enough money and ask for a snack that costs more than that, I will not give you a snack. And so you get the idea, right? If I do not have the snack, I give you your money back. It's like basic software, right? And um, and you know it executes itself, right? You, there's no you know there's no guard by um, by a vending machine, and um, and of course you can break the vending machine, but it's kind of not worth the cost, right? It's like really if you're really really like want you know a bag of chips or something, it's like are you really going to break a vending machine? Like so so that's the idea of a smart contract, right? And now if you put smart if you can find a way to put smart contracts on the blockchain. You can make a contract that executes some commands, and let's say a simple one is like paying somebody. You know, like a contractual obligation, like like you employ somebody, and you and maybe that person doesn't trust you to give them money, right? Um, and you know, like again, this is enforced by the state, but maybe it doesn't have to be, right? Maybe you can actually make a contract and put it on the blockchain. Once I put it on the blockchain, you can verify that it's there, and that and it has some money sitting in it, and it will dispense the money to the employee when certain conditions are met, right? And that gets that gets pretty hairy as well, but like the principle is more or less robust, right? So that's what a smart contract is. And so um, Ethereum came along, and Ethereum said, "What if we create a blockchain, which uh, rather than just doing something very simple like Bitcoin, um, it can uh, basically host smart contracts, and um, and and you can write smart contracts using a like a custom programming language." which can compile onto a blockchain that is then executed by volunteer nodes all around the world, right? So that's basically the idea of Ethereum. So if you're, how many people here are familiar with Ethereum? Okay, so, so maybe some of you haven't heard of Ethereum. If you're in the, if you're in the, in the decentralization space, it's a big name, obviously. Um, it's not the most valuable project in the space, but it, but it is probably the most talked about one because it's sort of the, has become the, well, I don't know that has the most potential, let's say. But there's other players in the space as well. So, okay, what can you do with smart contracts on the blockchain? Here's one. Um, so, the, the, and this is when, like, I guess starting in 2013 or 14, people started to craze about, like, the idea of decentralizing everything, like decentralizing all these things that we have companies for. So, uh, how does Kickstarter work, right? You guys know Kickstarter, right? Someone has some project, they want to crowdfund it, and they put a profile on the, on Kickstarter, and they go, "Okay, if you give me some money, I will do X, Y, and Z." And I, I need this much money, and then everyone can contribute money to them. And if it goes above a certain threshold, they the money goes to them, and if not, it returns back to the people who pledged it. So Kickstarter could be pretty easily implemented as a smart contract, right? Um, now, why would you want to do that? Well, maybe maybe that's not a particularly interesting use case. Like maybe the hyper libertarians are like, we don't like Kickstarter censoring projects that they don't like, and so on. Or or maybe we don't like Kickstarter skimming the profits, and this could could be just self executing contract. Um, whatever your your ethics are, like a lot of people like like there's there's of course a consistent debate about like who cares, like why would you want to do this in a decentralized way and. For our, for our purposes, it's actually quite, kind of irrelevant, so we won't get into a philosophical discussion about that. But the idea is that you can do this, essentially, as self-executing code. code. Uh, here's one that, that I'm, I'm going to put my weight behind and say that this one is pretty interesting. Uh, in, health insurance. How does health insurance work, right? Health insurance uh, works that companies manage it, right? And we pool our money together, and then you know the, the company manages our money and then gives it to people who, who are in need, right? The problem with health insurance, and this is, of course, a big scandal in this country in particular, um, is that um, once there's a profit motive in health insurance, then there's then there's this perpetual conflict between the health insurer and the uh, the uh, people in the, the the people getting insurance. There's a perpetual conflict, which is that um, there the company is always incentivized to deny healthcare, right? And this tension cannot it never goes away, right? This is why in mo in civilized places they actually they just ma make the state manage it, right? But um, uh, because that's kind of the best you can do. But what if you could? What if all of us could be a health insurance company together, right? Where nobody essentially profits from it. We are just sharing, pooling our money together. Now the the problem, of course, is how do we prevent fraud? How do we pre how do we manage it and so on? Managing is not a big deal because okay, it's like you know, admin can be automated more or less. But fraud is still kind of a big deal, right? 
Um, how do how do you deal with fraud? And now that's a really hairy question, and and it's, it's I don't have solutions for it. But the idea in the the ethic and decentralization space is maybe that could still be managed by humans, but the humans are sort of like made uh, the the responsibility is distributed as as much as possible over a wide group of people who are essentially disinterested in it. So like you can, and this is kind of how juries function, right? It's like it works kind of decently, right? You have this system where random people from around the country are, are judging, are supposed to be disinterested in a case and they're judging it, right? And that, and you could maybe, you could maybe accomplish something similar. Um, and, and, um, so that, that's interesting, right? Um, you could, okay. Other games that people cooperate with, you know, mutual funds and, and other sort of financial instruments, this idea of prediction markets, which I don't fully understand very well, but, but they're quite interesting. Uh, prediction markets is, this idea that you can, you essentially you have something like gambling, like betting on things, except you're betting on things that will happen in the world, and and uh, you're betting on whether whether or not that that, that they might be good things as well. Um, this closely tied to this idea of futarchy, which is this experimental idea like political organization, which we're not going to get into. It's just like this whole other thing. But look up futarchy if you want to hear like people like hypothesizing crazy schemes for the future. Identity systems, oh, I already mentioned Futarchy, and we'll actually get into liquid governance later. Uh, I'm going to mention that later. It's a really interesting thing. And then, okay, like smart properties. Uh, how many people here are familiar with city bike, right? You have this decentralized grid of, of bikes, right? Why? That could, be, like, that could be a public good. Like that could just be basically this, you know, you have, you, there's a token that gives you access to the bike, and uh, the token is managed through a blockchain. And you know you 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 can basically like come up to a bike and you know put the token back into the system, grab the bike for an hour, um, and and basically everything can be managed by a smart contract. It still has to deal with people. Like maybe it has to pay people to wash it or maintain the bikes or whatever. Um, but this kind of thing can can essentially be done as a public good, right? As a, as a as a, imagine taking things that could never be thought that we could never think of as public goods and making them public goods because you actually don't need someone to manage them, right? Or, or to, to sort of, um, yeah. Well, that, that's the sort of utopian uh, ethic uh, coming across. Um, I want to, I want to like, um, uh, kind of wrap up the first half. So I'll just go through this quickly. But I want to widen this discussion to about decentralization. It's not just about blockchains. It's not just about um, cryptocurrencies. It's really about like trying to take this computation. And, you, and and make it almost a communal a communal good, let's say, for uh, for pretty much anything that you can do electronically. And uh, it turns out the blockchains are not very good at, for certain things, right? So if you want to do high performance computation in a decentralized way, blockchain is not going to do it. It just doesn't process. It's not cannot process that much kind of data. So there's like initiatives like Gollum, let's say, which might use a blockchain for some aspect uh, some aspect of their operation, but otherwise it's some sort of like a network, a peer-to-peer -peer network of computational nodes, right? And then there's there's decentralized systems for storage. Let's say, imagine, imagine that all of us are like a, a decentralized Dropbox. So Dropbox is some sitting, you know, thousands of miles away. It has, you know, gigantic farm of, of storage and we keep all of our data on there. But what if instead we pooled all of our storage together and we were like a peer-to-peer -peer network serving each other's files for, in, uh, for us? And then we're duplicated in various places so you know that it's secure and that we're encrypted so you know it's secure and all this kind of stuff. So there's all these projects in the space that are, that are seeking to, to decentralize, you know, basically normal operations of computer. So yeah, it's not just blockchains, it's lots and lots of different things. Um, and, you know, there's a whole, um, a whole host of them. So uh, these are just the last three slides before we take a break, um, and and I want to put these sort of terminology into into your brains, right? So, and, and these are things that that people are being to talk about, right? To turn vocab words that are still kind of amorphous, but but are slowly becoming more concrete. A decentralized application is you know so bit you know like um, um, like even BitTorrent is a decentralized application, right? That the idea is that it's some software that is not hosted in any one place, it's not one in any one server, it's just peer-to-peer -peer software, right? That's a, a decentralized application. You might hear DAP by the blockchain people sometimes. Um, now, there's this emerging idea 
over the last three years that people are beginning to write about. And I, I would highly encourage you to like look up this terminology because it's really, it's still one of these things that like the definition is still being reached by consensus. In fact, a decentralized autonomous organization. So a decentralized autonomous organization is the idea that you can create organizations, potentially organizations of people, or at least in organizations that interface with people, that are decentralized in the in the ways that we've mentioned, and they're autonomous in the sense that they don't they don't depend on any. They basically live and breathe on the internet. And they don't depend on any of its participants. They just kind of interface with them, and they can uh, have access to their own capital. So they have assets. They might have. Uh, you know, real-world assets, they might have cryptocurrencies, they might have machine learning models, they might have people's data, they can, they can basically do all of the things that a server can do, um, except it's essentially, it has no CEO, it has no founders, nothing like that. Um, so this is the, this notion of a, a decentralized autonomous organization. Depending on who you ask, some people might say Bitcoin was the first DAO. Some people don't think that Bitcoin counts as a DAO because it doesn't, it's not smart enough, basically. Um, but, um, I think using the broadest definition, you can say that Bitcoin is a DAO. It's an organization that manages a cryptocurrency. It works with people, and it's and it's and it, no one can turn it off. Like there's, like it's just an idea that exists among all of us, right? So that's the idea of a DAO. Um, DAOs can interact with each other. So now you're getting into this like really really space age type stuff about you know a whole grid of DAOs, which which are sort of like superhuman in a way interacting with each other, exchanging cryptocurrencies, like all of this stuff is like, uh, you know, sci science fiction, but actually for real. DAOs are extremely, are extremely raw and undeveloped and, and, you know, very dangerous potentially, like, because we have no idea what we're doing as a species, like, like this idea of superhuman computation that's unstoppable, um, lots of, lots of uh, extremely dangerous use cases. You can imagine DAOs being pathological, there was a very famous, like one of the first DAOs that spectacular, spe spectacularly, you know, exploded was something called the DAO, um, which was in 2016, which is supposed to be something like a decentralized kind of like a mutual, uh, like a hedge fund in, in some sense, and uh, it had a serious uh, security flaw in its smart contract, and it basically lost people like 160 million dollars or something like that. So it was very, very serious, like very, very serious, like. You know, there's a lot of money on the line now, and um, this is extremely raw, underdeveloped, insecure technology. So, all of that stuff is is important to to kind of consider. These are some questions that you should be thinking about. You know, with these, like, what's it for? What new things does it enable? And this is going to be the focus of the second the second half of today, which is like, what are you know, what can we really do um, with with these with these things? Yeah. Okay, um, let's let's take a quick break and let's make this one kind of shorter. That these breaks keep on getting longer and longer. Like everyone's like 15, 20 minutes. I know I drone on and on, but like but this is gonna get really interesting. So like, uh, be back here at at uh, one fifty. Yeah, one fifty. There's kind of like this emerging idea and discussion at the confluence of a few fields that that have previously been kind of separate from each other, right? And there's kind of elements of computer science here. There's economics here. Um, there's aspects of law, and then there's this whole, um, you know, game theoretic component to it, which um, all of these things are merging, and uh, there now a, a number of people are beginning to use the term crypto economics to describe like the sort of academic uh, side of this undertaking, you know, this 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 field, and uh, within this field of uh, crypto economics, you can you see a lot of people theorizing about. The building blocks of new ways that we might be able to interact with online, and so this is really like kind of what you what we mean by crypto economics. It's like the coordination using computer science and and you know game theoretic economics to get large amounts of people who don't necessarily trust each other to coordinate over shared goals, and that's kind of like what we're what we're seeing here. Now, I want to talk about one what's called a crypto economic primitive, which you can, you can read about, uh, which, is, which is really uh, quite interesting and is quite relevant to the idea that I'm going to construct later. And um, we, we start by considering uh, the sort of more legacy uh, models for constructing companies that have existed for a long time. Um, obviously, like the way that companies work right now in, in uh, normal 
circumstances is that you know people come together they start a company they sign some papers and then they can start to make services right and then um, more recently there's this been this idea of an ICO the initial coin offering so if you've been if you've been paying attention to this space you know that 2017 in particular was a banner year for ICOs and 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 I'll explain what an ICO is in a second but um, ICOs became this um, this somewhat new although although in some you could argue that it's a continuation of legacy business models but uh, it is a new way of, of uh, funding uh, a company right that, that kind of emerged over the last few years so um, let's first of all talk about ICOs first and then we'll talk about some of its limitations right so imagine there's this some company that wants to start and create a new product we'll call them Google Zone right? anyone know that what that reference is to Google Zone Anyway, um, uh, so so Google's on. Let's say they, they want to raise a whole bunch of money because they have some pitch for an amazing new company product idea, right? What they can do is they can use the blockchain to mint a whole bunch of tokens. Uh, tokens are, like I said before, tokens are basically, you know, you can mint your own coin that you could use for transactions and in secured along a blockchain, a pre-existing blockchain like Ethereum, let's say. So, and most of these companies are using Ethereum. So you mint a token, you create some token, you let's say uh, mint sev several hundred or thousand or tens of thousands or whatever you want into existence. And then uh, you decide to keep maybe like, uh, well, well the idea is that the token is going to, it's going to uh, be used for uh, services that the company provides. So it's kind of the native token for which you know, uh, operate, transactions or operations are, are mediated with. And, um, and of course, if the token is good, like, or if the service is good, then the token might become in high demand. And if it becomes in high demand, it will become valuable, right? So there's this idea that token, of course, is, is also an investment. So they, uh, so the company will mint the token and they'll decide to keep some amount for themselves and for their, for maybe their families or whatever, their investors. And they will give the rest of them away through what's called an initial coin offering, an ICO. So a bunch of people come, people who are interested in what the company does, they want to participate in the company, and they will put up some money. That, and that, that money could be U.S. dollars, it could be euros, it could be it could be Bitcoin, it could be you know some other some other currency. And they will exchange, they will buy tokens with those um, with their money. And the company can use the money to pay for operations, of course, you know, companies still need money to operate. And they give everyone, the, these uh, investors, tokens that they could use to operate their, their services and, and as an investment, right? So, um, so okay, so that, that's been sort of like ICOs. That's how ICOs work. And more or less, it's a nice little crowdfunding model, right? And, and Lots of them have been pretty spectacular, like companies have raised hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases. Um, and, and of course, like, there's a lot of like, like scams, of course, associated with the space. So anyone who's been, who's been paying attention to it knows that probably the majority of ICOs were not necessarily scams, but just like kind of poorly thought out, you know, hype capitalization, right? Because there's, there's all these articles that you can read now that, that, that are quite correct, that, that like basically... Any company can just put blockchain next to their name, and it's like their valuation goes through the roof, right? And so, because of that, that that incentivizes a lot of entrepreneurs who, you know, maybe didn't really think think their ideas out through, and they just took like some idea they had for a business, and they they just like made it use a token instead of a U.S. dollar, and that's basically it, right? So most of them are not scams. There there have been some high profile scams, but. The quote uh, that I think is relevant here is never attribute to malice what can be explained by incompetence, right? And that's, I think, kind of explains most of them. And in, in most, for the most part, ICOs are usually legacy business models. And what I mean by legacy business models, it's, you know, it's, a, it's some founders, you know, and uh, they have investors and they have an idea for a product that they want to build and they hire developers and so on, right? So most of the ICOs were by legacy business models in that, in that sense of the word. But as we saw with the internet, Things become more interesting when new new operations evolve that take advantage of the medium itself rather than being an old model, an old business model plus new medium, right? Like, and, and, and an example of this is Blockbuster versus Netflix. Everyone remember Blockbuster Video? Blockbuster Video had a website 
blockbustervideo.com or whatever it was. And, and you know, more or less Blockbuster Video was, I, I don't remember, it was probably basically like, you know, you could reserve, I, I don't even know what it did, you could reserve a movie and then go into a Blockbuster location and pick it up, right? But then Netflix came along, and Netflix was born on the internet, right? Netflix was the idea that you can stream, that you can actually, buy, you could download and stream directly through the internet, right? So this is what I mean by yeah, enterprises that take advantage of the new medium. And we haven't really seen that yet with the, the crypto space, right? Uh, another example of this is Yahoo, Yahoo versus Google. So Yahoo originally, now Yahoo is a search engine, but originally all Yahoo was was like it was a big, gigantic like encyclopedia of everything that was online. And it turns out that that's not a very good way of keeping track of the internet as it's growing. And so Google came along and they had this, this and other things came along before Google that did search, but Google kind of perfected it, of course. And so now you have um, something that was born on the internet, right? Basically, like taking advantage of the new medium. And now, in spite of those things, ICOs do have some virtues, right? The idea that uh, a whole lot of people can uh, have a token which is native to that platform means that the company and the investors are aligned in the sense that they all that their their money depends on the value of the token, right? So they have what's what we call skin in the game. There's a really excellent book by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. For anyone who's familiar with this author, he wrote Anti Fragile and some some other books of that in the same vein. And skin in the game is all about how if you want to get perfectly functional systems, you need to make sure that the people making decisions are the ones who have who have things to lose from those decisions, right? A lot of like ills that we have in society have to do with people not having skin in the game, right? Not having not having their money on the line. Um, or, or various other incentives, right? So this, this really actually takes that to the next level, right? You're not just investing, it, 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 like having a, a token for specific to that platform means that whatever you can do to make that token valuable, you will try to do. And because every, all of the people that are, are aligned over the, the token, that encourages a certain kind of cooperation. And it's a new medium for funding, right? You don't have to use U.S. dollars that are issued by the, by the U.S. or euros that are issued by Europe, right? This is a new way that you can basically use internet money to publicly fund a company. So that's pretty interesting as well, right? So that, that's kind of where ICOs, um, you know, the, the takeaway from ICOs. ICOs have really dropped off, I think, in the last year or so. And, 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 and you know, for better or worse, I think, like, the, but the thing that we're really interested in is what comes after ICOs. And the thing that's been on the um, making the, the the rounds lately around the internet is this idea of continuous organizations, um, and and it goes under different different terms. Sometimes you hear liquid organization, and these are these are really really fascinating. And I'm going to try to make a case for them, and and um, I promise we'll get to machine learning soon. Um, okay, so here's the idea of a continuous organization. It's it's a company, you know, in the sense, uh, and it funds itself through a token. But now there's no uh, as uh, but now there's no single issuer of the token. It's not like some founders come along, and they mint one thousand tokens and they give away half of them to the public, right? Now there's nobody issuing the token. There's actually just a smart contract that issues the token, and the organization is essentially unbounded. It can have any number of participants, including zero, essentially, and. Um, and anyone can join it, right? There's not, there, there's not really a dichotomy anymore between founders and participants. It's something that basically spawns from a smart contract and can continue to grow unbound, in an unbounded way. And, um, and it can form and dissolve organically. So what, are, what is something that we could use to, to do this magic thing? Like how do we, how, how do people get the token if there's no one issuing them? No one issuing it yet, right? So here's the idea. You, use, you, you, you create a smart contract that gives the token to anyone who wants it, that mints it from scratch, according to a, a price set by a smart contract uh, uh, using a scheme which is called curve bonding. These are all new ideas from like the last two years or so. So you, you can certainly read about them. We won't get into a whole lot of depth about them, but here's the idea. Suppose you have a smart contract that issues a token for a price, let's say Ether or US dollars, and the price is rising as there are more tokens in supply. And the, the price is very low in the beginning, and then it gets higher and higher as, as there's more in supply. And uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be exponential or curved. It could be a straight line. 
Uh, it could even be stepped or, or you could even have a whole other smart contract determining the price. But, um, but the idea is that it, it, generally speaking, it, gets, it, it increases with, with the amount of tokens in supply. Now, how does this work? Why? Why would you do that? How does that work? So imagine, for, for example, you spawn this smart contract, which is supposed to um, basically stand for the operation of some, com some company that does something. And actually, let's let's get rid of the company for a second. Just assume that this is something simple that we that we can understand. It's like let's say, let's say it's a discussion forum where the token gives you um, gives you the ability to moderate, right, or upvote or downvote or something like that. Basically, people who have the token can participate in the discussion forum. Let's say, okay. Now, in the beginning, uh, it no it doesn't exist. No, there's no one there, right? All there is is a smart contract which says that there is a token of which there's currently zero in supply and the token will cost this much depending on how many tokens there are in the supply. So what happens is that somebody comes along and goes, I want the token and I will buy it, right? And, and, the, and let's say that it has a linear curve. So basically, linear curve, right? A linear, um, like the price is one, e like it goes up by one ether. It's, it's, it's exactly equal to the number of tokens that are in supply. So if there's one token in supply, uh, then it costs one one dollar. If there's one, if there's two, or sorry, if there's zero in supply, there's one dollar. If there's one in supply, there's it's two dollars. It just goes up by one as the, as it increases. So one person comes along, and they basically take some money, some U.S. dollars, let's say, or ether. Uh, actually, it's ether because I have one ETH over there, and they deposit it in this communal pot. Right, this smart contract is a communal pot that holds ether. Right? Ether is the cryptocurrency of Ethereum. It could be US dollars, though, if you want. Um, so the communal pot just holds the money. No one touches it. It's just, it just holds it. Right Now this person has this token, and they can participate in this discussion forum. They can upvote and downvote with it, let's say. And they had to place one Ether into the bin. Right. So now they're down one Ether, but they have a token. Another person comes along, and they want to participate as well. So they buy two tokens. The first one costs two dollars. The second one costs three dollars, right? Or ether. Um, I'll just stick with ether because it says ether. Um, so now the token, the next token, will cost four dollars, right? So it's becoming more expensive, right? Um, but presumably, this this uh, discussion forum is going along great. Like people are beginning to read it, and maybe maybe that will attract more eyes on it, and that, that increases the demand for the token for people who want to curate information that which is going to be read. You know, it's just as long as I'm holding the token, right? It's like my ownership share. It's not yes. necessarily like spending it. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. Oh, there, there are going to be different, I mean, there could be different schemes, models, but, but the basic but idea. It, the basic idea, shares. right? It's just it's just you get to stake it basically. Um, so, okay, like another person comes along and they buy a token for four Ether, right? It's becoming more and more expensive, right? Um, maybe the first person is like, okay, I did my job, I want to get out. They can actually, they basically, now the way it works is that you can also sell the token back for the amount that it costs at that moment, right? You basically take a proportionate amount of Ether back out of the pot. So this person, get the first person gets rid of their Ether and because the, 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 the value of it at that point is 4 Ether, they get 4 Ether back, and now they're plus 3 Ether. They've exited, but they've made money, right? So that's important, right? That means that there's a, there's a profit motive, there's an incentive to basically enter some sort of a, you know, like a discussion forum, let's say, and curate well, and then you get paid in the native token. Uh, sorry, you get you you eventually you can cash out and, and instantly, right? Because you have this communal pot, whatever you want, right? So that person cashed out. Maybe another person came along and they bought some ether for now. The cost was back down to four again. So now there's all this ether in the pot. Another person comes along, buys two. They have to buy for now five and six, right? It's getting more and more expensive. So the idea is that there's a natural equilibrium state, right? The more expensive it gets, at some point people are going to be dissuaded from joining because. You know, as long as you think that the that you can help this discussion forum, let's say, work uh, judiciously in such a way that demand for the token goes up, then maybe uh, maybe the price will continue to go up, and there's a profit motive. But obviously, there's a there's it can only go so high before the marginal price of the the token is just not not like uh, it, it's not 
it's it's too expensive basically you can't I'm not an economist but um, but okay so like this person gets in and then maybe okay person two now cashes out and uh, because the price is so high now they have two tokens they can put their tokens back in and make 11 euros or, or euros now okay uh, dollars <laughs> ether whatever you want they take them out of the supply and now they're plus six now right they're out right and maybe at some point, you know, like attention, you know, this, this discussion forum was about uh, some topic and attention and interest for it is beginning to wane. And as it's beginning to wane, people want to begin to exit, right? So this person exits and they actually like, they waited a little too long. They weren't able to, they actually are now down for Ether, right? They got rid of their, their tokens, but they weren't able to make all of it back because there's now only three Ether left. So now this guy gets out and then this one gets out and now now there's nothing left and now this uh, now there's nobody there there's no token in supply and basically the the project is over right so basically you have you can have some coordinated scheme with people that can that can grow from nothing with no central issuer and it can gr grow organically and it can dissolve organically when when it's no longer needed Right, and there's no ether in the token. Uh, there's no ether in the uh, the communal pot. That's that's out, and there's no um, and there's no more token in supply. Right, um, so this is this is the basic idea of this continuous organization, and 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 it's sort of the basis for curve bonding as well. That's why curve bonding is um, a, is is useful for it. Um, and um, on, uh, now another, uh, I should I'm going to skip token carried registry. This is I'm gonna skip that just just in a paper. Of, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, sorry. Like I don't see this organized, but anyway, um, token ecology. This is this, all this slide is supposed to be is like I like I really like this metaphor of um, I don't know if anyone really uses it, but it makes sense to me. Um, I think of this these things as kind of like uh, like almost like a water cycle. You know, it's like we have this amazing water cycle on Earth. Um, for now, anyway, uh, that basically, you know, recycles water and, you know, the, the amount of essentially H2O stays roughly constant in the, in the world, but it goes through all of these different, um, states and it goes into different places and it, you, know, you have groundwater, you have clouds, you have oceans and you have this beautiful cycle that's kind of self-sustaining and you can think of tokens in this way as well. Like if they're functioning well, you have this token that is like the, circulatory system of some functioning enterprise and uh, the token helps to coordinate people right just the same way that water helps to coordinate you know ecology essentially um, so that, that's all that's the only thing to make point um, now let's compare continuous organizations versus ICOs and and think about the differences right biggest difference is that there's no more founders like we have companies without founders um, or at least like, you know, there's less of a dichotomy between them. You could say that the first few people might function in the, as sort of quasi-founders because they're early adopters that kind of work to, to promote the culture of this in a certain direction, right? And so you still have something quasi-like founders, but now there isn't a hard divide between founders and non-founders. It's just a continuous sort of early adopter to late adopter curve. And um, the other great thing is, and this is true for ICOs as well, but, um, you, but it's even better for continuous organizations, there's really great incentives to, to be an early adopter, right? And this is counter to the, the typical effects that you observe with, with typical network effects. Now, network effects, if you've ever heard of the idea of a network effect, the network effect says that any network with very few people, uh, no one wants to join, right? Uh, and any network with many people is everyone wants to join, right? Um, because big networks are more valuable and all of your friends are already on this network, so you'll go there, right? And this is a huge problem for getting new projects uh, off the ground. This model uh, potentially counteracts that because now there's actually strong incentives to be, the, to be early on in, in projects and to try to work hard to make them interesting, right? right? So this is kind of... This is, this is, I think, is, is um, a really, really great idea. And then um, the organization, as we might think of it, can form and dissolve, dissolve organically, right? Because there's no, again, like, there, all that has to be is, like, someone has to put a smart contract on there. It doesn't need any uh, initial funding. It doesn't need any ether or anything. It just, it just, you know, basically all of us are pooling our money together. 
to make it work. So what can you do with tokens, right? And, and let's kind of uh, like think of this in the, in the context of a, of a continuous organization, right? So um, the reason why I use this discussion forum as the, as the first example use case is because um, it's, it's a pretty easy one to understand and it's also closely allied with this idea of a curation market, um, which, which for, was first written about in 2017 by this guy Simon de la Rubia, um, who, who I'll mention later because he also mentioned this autonomous artist idea. So um, suppose you have this continuous organization which is bound by this, by this current bonding scheme, right? People, people can participate with this common pot and they have a token. And what do they do? Okay, they're moderating a discussion forum, right? Maybe they're moderating dank memes, right? Something like that. And um, the token gives you influence, like curational influence. You can upvote, you can downvote. And um, because the goal, of course, is to make this forum get a lot of eyes on it, you know, because because you like why well why why would that be the goal, right? Well, if it has a lot of eyes on it, then probably a lot of people are going to want to curate on it. And in order to curate on it, you need the token. So more people will buy the token if this is a functional thing with a lot of readership, right? So this again, this is the skin in the game idea. It gives you the incentive to curate judiciously because it makes your token more valuable. So all of these people are kind of coordinating with each other essentially to make a, uh, a functional curatorial scheme, right? So um, now, how, like, like, let's imagine, for, for example, a decentralized version of Reddit. So a decentralized version of Reddit, which is some software running on the blockchain, and anyone can start a channel and by, by basically saying, okay, there, the, there's going to be a token associated with this channel and you are the first person to mint a token for that channel into existence and you're the first curator, right? And then more people can come and curate. And the, the, the better the, the curatorial you know, practice is, then the, then the more token will come into existence, the more, you will, the more money you will make. And of course, like, memes are a natural ally to this, right? Because memes are also things that kind of grow and dissolve organically. You know, who knows where they come from, right? And some of them never really die. <laughs> Um, but of course many do, and so maybe some of these channels would die over time and so on. But um, this is kind of the first use case, like, and this is called the curation market. But um, curation market is, is actually like a little ambiguous because nowadays because it can be used in a more broad context as well. So let's zoom out and consider this a little more broadly, right? Um, curation, I thought I had another slide here. Oh. Um, Oh, I had a, I had a, okay, I, 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 I'm missing a slide, but okay. Um, I'll, or maybe it's just hidden, that slide? No, it's not. Um, it's not as long as it looks, because there's one that's like a slideshow, basically, that'll go quickly. Okay, anyway, um, so, so c consider curation a little more broadly. Like, if you think about it, almost everything on the internet is a form of curation, in some sense, right? Because search results are curated, right? Uh, your trending topics in, in social media are, 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 is a curated list. Um, you might also like product recommendations are, are, is a curated list. Um, you know, what else is, is, a, is a curated? Pretty much everything you do on the internet is, 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 some, is some form of, of uh, curation. Your, time, your Twitter news feed, right? Is, you're is, curating for other people's love for no reason other than for the simple fact that you're doing it. Well, or, or a company is curating for us, right? right? So pretty much everything can be considered curation. It, you know, if you if you de um, decouple the idea of curation from just arts and entertainment, right? Curation is basically selecting some amount of information and displaying it um, because it's more relevant, right? So almost everything that you do on the internet is basically curation in this form, uh, in this in this sense, right? And um, so th so therefore, you you can imagine all of them in the sense of a curation market, something that people can, can actually um, use a token to curate judiciously because it's their money on the line, right? There's actually this incentive to do so. And, uh, and, and a really gr great um, like use case for this, if you think of curation more broadly, is you can almost think of the coordination over a software repository as a form of curation as well. So Node, for example, this is, you're looking at Node, right? There's Node.js, some GitHub, and you know there's there's there have been 
uh, there's like, um, okay, look how many pull requests are outstanding, look how many issues there are. There's been like thousands of people that have contributed to it. It's just this gigantic thing, right? But there's also like basically like ultimately like one set of, of people who manage the entire node repository, right? And they kind of manage all this. But imagine a software repository which, were, which was managed as a curation market. So now the uh, feature requests, let's say it requests for features and, and um, proportionate importance of different uh, issues can be curated with a token. So, you know, if we are collaborating together on a piece of software, we can use our token to decide this feature is the next most important thing to develop, this feature is the next most important thing to develop. You can even imagine the developers that su submit pull requests being paid in the native token themselves. Now that, that kind of, we'd have to figure out how that works with the communal pot and everything, but in principle, it's, it's, it's uh, possible. Yeah? Uh, would it be, or is anyone talking about the potential earning the token so that there's not, it's not necessarily buying it up front, but then... Yeah, that, that's the idea. Maybe maybe developers can be paid in the token. I don't, I don't know exactly, like, a lot of people have written about this in much more detail, like, um, and, and I, I would think that that's, that's a scheme that, but you'd have to figure out exactly how that would work with, with the communal pot, because it has to be available, right? Maybe there's some, I don't know, actually. Maybe some of it is reserved for, for or maybe some, some percentage of it is used for, to pay people, you can imagine. Um, in any in any case, like um, uh, in, in any case, like you you know this form of governance here, right, is a form of governance essentially, right? Govern governing the development of this software, and you can manage it as a curation market, right? And um, again, like you can imagine now extrapolating this to to essentially any business model, right? Curation is a form of decision making you think that this is more relevant than this, this, this idea. And so this is kind of like where this is all going, right? Um, I mentioned earlier this idea of a liquid democracy, which is very closely related. Um, this, this can be the basis for an entirely new form of democracy even. This is like where some of the real, this is what really brings out the social engineers online, is this idea uh, of like new forms of, uh, of cooperating on governance, right? And, and this idea of liquid democracy, which can be used, you know, in tandem with the curation market, is somewhere between a direct and representative democracy. Here's how it works. It, the way that democracy works right now is that every four years or something, we all get together and we vote in some representatives and then they, you know, lobby on behalf of us, right? Uh, this has lots of limitations, of course. It has lots, lots of weaknesses. One is that you have to wait every four years or whatever, which is kind of obsolete now. It's no, no real reason for that. And, um, and also because, like, you know, there's, you know, people recognize that direct democracy has its, has its virtues as well. Uh, some decisions should just be made by the people, right? Uh, but direct democracy has weaknesses as well. It's really difficult to manage, and people don't know what the hell they're voting about usually. So uh, in the liquid democracy, you have essentially, you start with a direct democracy where everyone has a token that lets them vote on issues, right? And, and maybe they have multiple tokens that they can you know, maybe they have multiple tokens, let's say. And the idea is that now you can delegate your tokens to anybody. Um, you can delegate your tokens to, like, um, let's say you have a friend who's really politically active and you trust that they will make good decisions on your behalf. You can, get, you can delegate your token to them. And then, uh, so let's say you're like this person right here who has their two friends have given, uh, have given them, you know, their tokens and, they have their own token, so they have three. And now they can delegate to somebody else who they trust. And you have this sort of organic network where people can delegate tokens to each other that eventually lead to representatives. And the representatives have proportional influence according to the amount of tokens they hold. And then they vote on things, right? And the nice thing about this is that uh, now there's, this is why it's called a liquid democracy. It's liquid because it, there's no fixed size. There's not like 538 representatives or whatever. It's actually anybody can be part of the governance structure as long as they have some tokens delegated to them, vested in them, right? And they can participate. And also, there's no need for elections anymore because essentially uh, the delegation of the token is a continual process. You can revoke it at any time. If you don't like the person anymore because you don't like what they did, you can just revoke your token and they can no longer make decisions on your behalf. 
So all of these things are like really crazy social engineering ideas that, that, that can be applied both on you know, government as we see it now, you know, governance structures at a national level, or governance projects at a small level, you know, like let's say the governance of a s small software repository or something like that. Um, and again, you can use tokens to, to delegate all of this, right? The token can be used for curation, and curation is a form of governance, essentially, you know, a form of decision making, you know, if you want to consider it in the broadest possible extent. Okay, finally, machine learning. So what does this have all to do with machine learning? The first thing we want to talk about is how can machine learning be decentralized? So machine learning is highly, highly centralized, right? Because, and, and the way we think of it right now is that, okay, you have some AI incorporated, some company that does some, that, that um, provides a service, right? This, this is basically, this, this more or less describes 100% of companies that use machine learning today. You have a company, that company provides a service, usually cat videos, to a population of users. And those users get that service for free and they pay uh, for it essentially by giving their data to the company. And that company uses it, uses their data to train a neural network or, a, or well, it doesn't have to be a neural network, but let's say it's a neural network, a machine learning model to do that service better. So send better cat videos and um, for free, right? And the trade-off is that now that company can sell either the services of that model or the data directly to third parties for money. So there's this asymmetric, there's this asymmetric value exchange that's going on, which is that you accept that your data can be shipped off for, uh, you know, you, you give it away for free, but you get this, this, uh, this uh, you know, streaming or whatever of cat videos for free. So, but that's asymmetric because, you know, who knows how much either one is worth, right? Um, and, and of course, this has all sort of like secondary side effects, which are undesirable. And we've learned a, about a lot of them in the last year. Uh, you can think of some scandals, of course. So this describes machine learning basically in a nutshell, right? And, and it has a bunch of weaknesses. One is that we already talked about the centralization of power. Companies that have a lot of data have a lot of power. Like, that's just, that's just the fact. And um, small companies essentially have to depend on big companies to, to, um, to get off the ground. And, and we have something like that has emerged in Silicon Valley, that's for sure. Something of a command economy these days. And uh, another big problem is privacy. There's perpetual conflict between the users and the company about the privacy of their data, right? The companies always want you to give more data and to allow it to be used for more things. Um, and related to this privacy issue uh, is that certain kinds of data are so sensitive that you will not share them, even if it's guaranteed to be, or even if the company says it'll be private, you, you won't share them because it's very personal, let's say. Um, and there's kind of a loss of opportunity there, right? Because you can imagine that personal data can, can actually be used in, in many, can be in principle used in many beneficial ways, but of course, it's so sensitive that you're, you're not willing to risk it. So there's this related to privacy, this issue of sensitive data doesn't, get, doesn't go anywhere. Another problem is that there's a lost natural income. And this is something that people have been talking about since the early days of social media. Uh, I know Jaron Lanier is, is kind of one of the big voices on this idea that, that like uh, basically producing data for companies, you know, is a form of labor essentially. It may not seem that way. It's like when you're, you know, when you're browsing the internet, you feel like, um, you know, you, you feel like whatever. It's just something I'm doing. But it, it, the thing that you're doing is actually valuable for the company. And so, and so, in a sense, like you think that when you do something valuable for a company, you get paid for it, right? But you don't get paid for it, right? So there's a lost natural income there. Uh, the benefit though is that the model is secure because it's centralized. So okay, that's that's one thing. So um, we can do a little bit better, and I'm going to describe the open mind approach to this. Um, and open mind is a really interesting open source initiative that describes a different way of doing machine learning in a way that's decentralized and, and secure and private. So here's how it works. Um, there's this concept of federated learning. Federated learning is something that exists. It's done by companies like Google and Apple. Federated learning says, okay, there's a machine learning model that does something valuable, like let's say spell checking, something like that, right? 
and everyone has the spell check model on their phone that does spell check for you. And uh, so when you're typing, you're not constantly sending um, all of the things that you're typing to the companies and then they're sending you spell check recommendations back. That would be obviously very inefficient, but also it's unnecessary. Uh, what you can do instead is Apple, let's say if they're managing iPhones, they send you all, everybody, the same spell checking model. And then you are on the spell checker, you, you get it helping you spell check, but also you improve the spell checker because you can give it feedback. You can say, oh, this, this is wrong, it actually should have been spelled this way, blah, 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 right? So what are you doing when you're doing that? You're training it, you're, you're, you're providing gradients, right? And we've talked about gradients a little bit in machine, with machine learning there, changes to the model that improve the model. So you generate some gradients and then you send them back, those gradients back to Apple Apple takes gradients from everybody and combines them and improves the model that way and then sends you a new updated spell checking model, right? This is called federated learning. Uh, and this is the deal, I, like as I, this is very sneaky. It's like, okay, you get to keep your data because you don't have to s send your data to them anymore, in, in theory. Uh, but we get to train the model on your batteries. So, hey, why not? Um, okay, so that's, so that's federated learning, right? So let's imagine that we, we uh, did federated learning instead of centralized machine learning. So with federated learning, now you have AI incorporated, they create a model, but this time, instead of just sending the service, you know, the cat videos, they actually send the model to the user. So the user gets to keep the model, and then they send cat videos, and then the user sends back gradients, and gradients are improvements that they have made to the model, feedback. And then AI Incorporated takes these gradients and uses it to update the model, to improve the model. And then they uh, send better cats, and then they send, and then they can sell the model and the data to the third parties as before. So this is federated learning essentially. Now there's a couple of uh, there's uh, there's okay there's a new there's a pro here right, which is that now the data is not centralized, not exactly centralized. Um, so. So that's, that's, that's a good start, although, although it's not quite as good as it seems because there's this field called differential privacy, which basically says that you can recover people's data without having it just through the gradients. So when they send changes to the model, you can actually infer aspects about their data through that. Um, so you can't actually guarantee through federated learning alone that, you, that you're ensuring people's privacy. Yeah? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just a little lost with this uh, cat video data analogy. Yeah. What might be an actual example of this sort of uh, system? Like spell what? checker, you know, your, your spell checking systems, maybe uh, maybe when you do like a translate translation thing on your phone, okay. that could be a downloaded model. So um, the personal data would be what you type and how it... It, it would be like if you correct it, you know, it goes like, okay. is this correct? And you, you might correct it. You might say, actually, that's a bad translation or... or you know, and you see that in the Google Translate interface, right? Those get submitted back to Google. Um, so, uh, so differential privacy is still an issue. Uh, there's still this lost natural income that hasn't been addressed at all. And then the model is also, now there's a new problem actually, which is that the users can steal the model. Because you just send them this awesome model and now the users can steal it. So that's not actually very good for AI Incorporated that may dissuade them from actually sharing it. So um, here's, uh, here's where things are going to get complicated. And this is, well, it's not that complicated. You can understand it at a high level. So there, there's, um, there is a, a type of experimental encryption, which is something of the holy grail of encryption, uh, and it's called homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is a type of encryption which allows you to perform mathematical operations on the ciphertext, which are preserved when the, when the uh, ciphertext is decrypted. So let me give you an example of that. If you have a homomorphic encryption, you can take, let's say, the numbers 3 and 5, encrypt them, you get some random cipher, right, which is unreadable, right, the data is unreadable, but you can do something like take the cipher A, you know, cipher A, multiply it by 2, take that result and decrypt it and, and get the value 6, you know, as though, so basically you're, you're doing mathematical operations on encrypted data, uh, but the encrypted data cannot be seen because it's encrypted, right? Or you can add cipher A and cipher B together, decrypt that, and you get 8. You know, 3 plus 5 equals 8. 
So um, this has many, many potential uh, implications. It, it would mean, for, in, for example, that you can do machine learning on encrypted data. So you can take people's data, um, or you can take data from someone that needs to be private, and do some machine learning on it, and not actually see the data. Um, this has all sorts of interesting applications to, to things like, uh, even like surveillance. It's very interesting. Like, how would you, how would uh, your view change about surveillance if surveillance could make strong guarantees on privacy? It almost doesn't even make sense to think about it, right? Like, surveillance and privacy are opposites, right? But could you actually do surveillance with, uh, with what would you be willing to accept now? You know, if you could do surveillance with, with privacy, at least, at least to a large extent. So a lot of these things are almost like they sound like oxymorons, but they're actually like like uh, ideas that could that could work. Um, Is this how Numerai works? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I actually have a slide on Numerai coming up. Yeah, nice, nice, uh, nice catch. I'll, I'll mention Numerai in a, in a bit. Okay, so now let's combine federated learning with homomorphic encryption. So here's the new protocol, and incorporated initializes the model. They produce two encryption keys, a public and a private key. They encrypt the model. Right, so now, and, and actually you can encrypt either the data or you can encrypt the weights. So here, they're, they're actually encrypting the model itself. Uh, the reason why they're doing that is so now it can't be stolen. Uh, for, for reasons I don't fully understand, actually, I have to look that up because, okay, it still works in some sense, but, okay, the model weights are encrypted, just know that, and that prevents it from being stolen. So now they send the encrypted model to the users. The users have the encrypted model. The encrypted model still works, right? Because you can do mathematical operations with homomorphic encryption. So they send the gradients back as before. The AI encrypted updates the model. They can decrypt it because they, they have the, the encryption key. And then um, they sell the model as before. Okay, so cool. This, this means that the model is now secure. So this is the same as thing as before, but the, now the model is more secure. However, there's still the lost natural income problem. That's still a problem. And differential privacy is still an issue because they're still collecting gradients from the users. Okay, so now things get even more tricky. Now instead of AI Incorporated managing, I know we're going like really, really, <laughs> I hope I haven't lost some of you. Um, I promise this is going towards, towards something really inspiring. That's the, that's the takeaway. Um, in any case, like, okay, so now it's the same thing except now there's a smart contract in the middle. And now, AI Incorporated makes, initializes the model, encrypts it, sends it to the smart contract. The smart contract now holds the model. And now the smart contract manages everything. They will manage the gradients, and, um, and, and, and as a bonus, they'll do one more thing. They will take money from AI Incorporated. So they have some cryptocurrency, and the smart contract sends the model to the users. The users have the model. They pr get services from the company. They train the model and they send the gradients not to AI Incorporated but to the smart contract. And now the smart contract puts them all together and uses it to improve the model. AI Incorporated never sees this process, right? It's just being done by a smart contract. The smart contract now pays people for, the, for their data and then sends the trained uh, model back to AI Incorporated and now uh, they decrypt it with the, the green key, uh, provide better service, and they can sell the model as before. So now they sell services to the model, not the data. Okay, this is getting really close, right? Because now the data is not centralized. Now the privacy is guaranteed because AI Incorporated never sees everyone's gradients. They just get mixed together into a big salad. Uh, not, not to a salad, to a soup, actually. Soup of gradients. Why not? And, um, and as a bonus now, there's this uh, compensation going on where the users are now actually being paid for their data in cryptocurrency. So that's really great uh, because now, um, now, there's this in, now there's this lost natural, private, lost natural income uh, problem has been partially solved. So, uh, so, and, and the model is also secure, secure from theft. There's still one more problem, which is maybe a little bit too level, low level for us, and it has to do with who holds the keys. We can complicate this just a little bit more, like, but we, we'll, we'll just skip this because it's not important for us. There's this notion of, a, of an oracle. An oracle is a disinterested third party that holds the encryption keys. So now all this stuff happens where the oracle basically, what's going on here? Um, the oracle is, is this frozen? Hello? OK. 
Okay. Uh, yes, yes, they are. Okay. Yeah, I had a little. Oh, I think because there's like a million images here. I don't know. Anyway, the Oracle manages the contract and the money, and the you and uh, the smart contract. It, everything is before except basically the Oracle sits between the contract and AI Incorporated. They manage the keys. The, the, this is this notion of an Oracle is very common in the crypto space. It's like a sort of disinterested third party intermediary. Um, let's say like a judge, you know, and and basically like the Oracle is some somebody who will put up like a ton of money basically to uh, as a as a sort of bounty, and they promise to to tend to the keys so that no one can decrypt it until everything is done. And um, if there's some shenanigans that are detected, they lose the money that they staked. It's like a lot of money. And if no shenanigans are detected, they get paid a little bit for the service. So it's they're like an insurance company essentially. Um, Okay, so this, all of this basically, the takeaway is that you have this way of doing machine learning where privacy is guaranteed, model is secure, users are compensated for the data. So now you have this natural exchange where data, labor for data is paid for, right? And, and, and maybe the service isn't free anymore, right? Maybe, maybe that's the way things should be. Like maybe, maybe it would make sense if we went back to an economy that didn't trade people's privacy instead of trading services. Um, so yes, this is sort of centralized mining, um, centralized machine learning versus decentralized machine learning. Decentralized machine learning is much more complicated, obviously, and it's much less efficient. However, it has all of these advantages. You can create an economic model that that is. It feels much more natural, right? Right? Like people perform a service to you by producing data, so they should be compensated, and there's no more trafficking people's uh, private data. And um, another really great thing about this, I don't know if I have, yeah, I don't have a slide about this, but another great thing about this, and this is a point raised by, by the Open Mind team, is using this model, AI Incorporated can guarantee they never see anybody's data. The data, in fact, never leaves the devices. So if we're a population of people that are, that, that you know, they ha we have a, you know, our data is mutually reinforcing a model that we share, right? And, and maybe that model can be operating on even very sensitive data, right? Like, like we said, this is a really big problem. You know, you don't share, let's say, let's say for uh, like health reasons, you know, you don't share your health data with, with companies because you're afraid and for very good reason, <laughs> very good reason, uh, you're afraid that those companies will misuse that data and mis and use it against you, right? Or, you know, you're afraid of it being stolen or, or you know, like, like th think about the most sensitive things, things of physical and mental health, right? Now, what if you have a model that um, that no? First of all, the data never le you your private sensitive data is always with you. No one ever gets to see it. However, all of us can actually pool our sensitive our sensitive data together in a way that no none of us get to see it, and create models that can actually um, that that can actually uh, like perform services from this kinds of sensitive data. Think about mental health applications, right? And, and this is something people underestimate, right? The, that the fact that machine learning can actually s tell so much about you. There's there's all kinds of research that shows that machine learning can tell things about us from social data that you wouldn't even believe. Like these things know before anybody, in, including you. Like <laughs> they know when you're when you're going to propose to your to your your significant other. They, you know they know like all sorts of like they can predict. Your, your preferences and all, all sorts of things, right? They can predict when you're depressed, when, when you have anxiety, or like all this kind of mental health stuff. Imagine that uh, you can create models that can, that can actually know, uh, like, like if, uh, well, I don't know, like you can, you can just use your imagination, like maybe they know when you're in trouble, right? And maybe they can actually alert you privately, right? Like it's just a machine. There's no company at the other end of the, uh, at the other end of the line. They can actually like, it tell you what you should eat, be eating or something like that. Like all these kinds of things that you can imagine, uh, but that we just can't even dream of doing now because the, the data is too sensitive. So that, that's one of the value propositions that, that, that this kind of machine learning setup can potentially make. Yeah. So uh, Numerai was mentioned, of course. So like Numerai is a, is a, I wanted to mention Numerai very briefly because it's also an example of this this notion of, um, it's not exactly decentralized, but it's, it's, it's going in that direction. So Numerai is this company um, which, um, which is basically something of a decentralized uh, hedge fund. 
So, um, like, and, and this is the first thing in finance that I've ever been interested in. Like, I promise you, like, it's, it, and I, I, like, I, I, I got a, deg like, a degree in applied math in New York, and it's, like, in before 2008, and it's just, like, like, it's just, a, like, uh, you really have to, like, escape the vortex of financial, like, uh, I mean, New York before 2008, especially, like, um, you, you really have to be very disinterested in finance to, to not... To, to uh, not be in it, but but this is actually the first thing I've ever thought was really cool. So here's the idea: Numeri has this amazing data set that they that they you know spent some data scientists spent years figuring out a way of making a data set that can be used for a hedge fund. Hedge funds all have their own data sets, right? That they that they use to like um, you know try to make predictions on the market and make and make money, right? So this the idea of this is that it's basically a uh, th what they do is they take this data set and they encrypt it. They encrypt the actual data and they publish it. And then they, they invite data scientists, freelance data scientists, to, to submit uh, predictions on the model uh, of what to, of what to uh, invest in, basically investment decisions. Um, they're able to do this because the, the data is very valuable, but they encrypt it so, they, so it can't be stolen. And the idea is that Every week they have what's called a tournament, I think, and what happens is that they invest in, in the market, depending on basically the collective wisdom of all, all these data scientists, and then the, uh, whatever proceeds that they make in the following week from their investments get uh, sent back to the data scientists in proportion to how much they improve the model, which is something that has to be measured and that can be measured, basically. Um, but, uh, but, 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 uh, basically, you have this like this this crowdsourced hedge fund where data scientists, you know, can uh, can cooperate with each other to make a meta model which is smarter than any of their individual models, basically. And uh, Numeri is, is quite interesting, and they they have a they want to become decentralized fully, which means that the data would also be decent, like the data would be uh, a collaborative effort by you know everyone who wants to work on it, basically. And they have this amazing uh, blog post called the um, Numerize Master Plan. It's really funny. It's like I mean, to, to use to, to call it that, where um, uh, uh, I think the guy's name is Richard Crane. He, he talks about how he wants Numerize to be to manage all of the world's money. Um, and it, like, like basically, it, it will be the financial instrument for the entire world. Cause, and why not? Like, it, it can literally be, it could literally, like, uh, it, it's basically participatory, so maybe okay. All of us delegate our money in data scientists, and then they—I don't know. It's like read the blog post. It's 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 beyond our, our scope, but it's 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 kind of fascinating, I'd say. And and it's a little bit of an influence on this autonomous artist idea. It's all week weekly based, though. I think they do it on a weekly basis, yeah. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Right. You can imagine having different kinds of models. Um, okay, now we talked about IPFS earlier. And, and we're getting to the point where I can now introduce the, the autonomous art, artist idea. But the, um, the one last concept that I want to mention is this idea of decentralized data. Because we, we didn't really give it proper, you know, uh, proper deference. The, um, the, so, um, like, uh, okay, this, this is kind of some, so this is, a, this is a company called Ocean. And what they're trying to do is to try to create a protocol that lets people put data online. And that could be any kind of data, you know, that could be your own social, social media data, um, that could be bank data, whatever. Uh, and the idea is that it can be managed in a decentralized way where the user or the, the person who puts the data on there has the final rights to that data. So imagine for, for a moment that, you know, that the companies that make up the internet today, Facebooks and Googles and Twitters and so on, Instead of having their own private data silos, they are instead, there's instead one database, which is a sort of global commons, right? A global common database where the users contribute the data and then the companies are a service layer on top of the global data commons, right? That basically Facebook, the content of Facebook is not stored inside of Facebook. It's something that Facebook leases, basically, that they have to, they have to take from this global data center or it's not a global data, it's a global data commons, let's say. And, uh, and they, they, it's like there's an API on top of it, and Facebook creates some service on top of it. 
right, on top of this database. This has a lot of uh, virtues to it, right? Uh, because, okay, now if you're creating valuable data, you know, maybe you're a content creator or you're an artist or whatever, and, you know, you're putting all this data onto a platform and, you're, and it's subject to that platform using it in the way that you, you, using it in a certain way. Like maybe they change their model and it invalidates your, your whole, your everything, right? Um, you're really at the mercy of, of, of the, the company, right? And, you know, like, the, like, of course, like, you think of a lot of people make a, make a living off of social media, basically, like YouTube and, you know, Twitter, whatever, Instagram. So what if instead of that, your data went into this decentralized data commons and it's, it's, it's always there for you. Like you can put it there, you can revoke it, you can license it, um, and you essentially license it to, to services like Facebook. And if Facebook ever changes their business model in a way that you don't like, you can, take, you can revoke their, their access to your data and put it into some, somewhere else. Like imagine that you could turn all your tweets into Facebook posts if you suddenly disliked Twitter and liked Facebook more or you know or some other company right so this is the kind of thing that you can potentially enable if we decentralize data as well and there's all sorts of there's all sorts of use cases for this of course data is really the fuel of the internet and so um, and so you can you can imagine that this is this could get a lot of traction now of course the problem is that data likes data you know so data silos are very powerful because they have most of the data and so to create a, a decentralized data commons that competes with them is it would take a lot of work but you know the, the, the technological components are there so potentially you might see that in the future okay finally we get to the autonomous artist okay <laughs> and, and and this is the this is like what this sort of next future class is all about we have all of the pieces to really sort of flesh this out so first of all like what if on the spiritual level um, like I, I think of it, I think of this as a as a as something of a, a spirit like that because okay if you like the the idea at, at, at the highest level is you know we would like to try to create a being that creates art and, and is truly a being like like a being the way that all of us are beings right and of course this is the principal aim of AI but as I said like no one's paying attention to the autonomous part and so how can you create a being that's not autonomous right. Um, if you can create a program, a decentralized autonomous organization, essentially, which, um, which is, which, whose function is to create art, is to generate art, um, what, what would that be? I think of it as a spirit. It's, an, it's a generative spirit, in a sense. Um, and, and this is its mascot, I, I suppose. And so um, the autonomous artificial artist is basically an autonomous... AI, a decentralized AI, that creates art using generative models, right? So what are all the pieces? All the, we, we know the pieces now, right? There's, there's uh, oh, uh, let me, before I mention the pieces, let me just mention some inspirations to this, right? Because there are, there are already ideas in this space that are, are, that are, that are aligned, uh, somewhat aligned, um, or exploring similar themes, at least two, at least one project, which is very closely aligned, which I'll, which I'll mention in the next slide. Some of you may be familiar with CryptoKitties. This is probably the most popular thing that's, that, 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 that Ethereum has produced so far. CryptoKitties are these like um, basically collectible uh, like little you know, kitty icons or ma mascots which have a sort of genetic data that, that produces them. They're generative, right? And the, um, the genetic profile of each kitty uh, is, is basically stored on a blockchain as a token and the tokens can be traded for each other, right? So you can trade and you can sell them and you know, really cute kitties, like people will pay more for them, right? more ether, let's say. And there's also this platform called Super Rare, which is um, basically a, um, allowing people to place artworks that they make onto the blockchain, they stamp them, and then they can, they can be traded on the blockchain, like as assets, basically. Okay, so that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, it's more or less legacy business idea with art, with respect to art, right? It's an art market that uses a, uses a blockchain to, to manage the transactional part of it, right? Which is cool, but, but, um, but not exactly an autonomous spirit, in my opinion, anyway. 
Um, something that's getting closer to that space is crypto.ai. And I'm not, I'm not actually sure what the status of this project is. I think it's, um, it, it seems to be in, in some sort of release stage. I don't know how much progress they made. It's from last year. But crypto.ai is, is basically like crypto kitties, except it uses, a, again, it actually uses a generative model, which, which does nothing but uh, is trained on anime, basically, or manga. So, so it just generates endless manga characters, and each manga character is what? It's an it's a embedding. It's an embedding in the generative, in the latent space, and we've been talking about these all semester. So, you know, it's a, basically it's got a DNA, which is Z. It's the Z code, and you can trade the Z code, and that gives you access to this particular manga character. So it's a pretty cool idea, and it starts to, it starts to put some of these pieces together, right? Um, for the most part, it's still more or less in this genre of collectibles, like cri crypto collectibles. Uh, but now there's a machine learning component to it, which is, which is pretty cool, right? Um, now, another uh, idea that, that starts to really get close to, to what we're talking about is the, um, is the idea of an art DAO. Uh, and, and I would trace this to be like the earliest influence on this idea of an autonomous artist. And um, the two people that I would associate with this are Trent McConaughey, which, who, uh, who's the founder of Ocean, which I just mentioned, the decentralized data database, and Simon De La Ruvier, who also came up with uh, curation markets and curve bonding. So they started writing about, in 2016, 2017, this idea of an art DAO. So here's the, 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 the really basic formula that for, in, like the most high level approach to an art, an art DAO. The ArtDAO is a generative art producing program um, which creates generative art, makes multiple editions of it, and stamps them on the, on the blockchain so it has a particular signature associated with it. And then it gets sold on you know, whatever art platforms there are, Getty, Shopify, Open Bazaar, maybe it gets sold in Super Rare or whatever. And then um, the, a buyer can buy it for cryptocurrency, pays for it to the ArtDAO, and the art DAO um, uses that money to pay for computation um, that's necessary to, to produce the artwork. Or maybe it keeps some profit, right? Um, so, so like the, the thing they wrote about in, in two, as far back as 2016 is this idea that you can create a, like a program that generates art and sells it. And, and it's not like you sell it, it's the art DAO sells it, right? It can make money from people buying its art. Like maybe it could become a rich artist, like maybe it could become a millionaire or a billionaire. You know, like there's no reason in principle if it made really good art and got a lot of publicity that it couldn't be at least as rich as Damien Hirst, right? So maybe you, like maybe this is a formula for making the world's first like uh, completely non-human billionaire. So that's, so just think about that for a moment. Um, so th that's sort of the idea of the art DAO, right? And I think we can, and basically, like now, they they kind of didn't they didn't really go beyond this formula. But then uh, Simon recently started a few months ago a project called Autonomous, and the idea of Autonomous is very much like uh, more or less to make an autonomous artist. And the idea, and basically, it it um, and 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 they, so it's it's more or less all the ingredients that we have, except it doesn't have any it doesn't really have any notion of machine learning built into it. Nevertheless, it's like okay, you have a generative art making algorithm, which produces some synthetic art that can be then traded within, with one of these um, ERC721 tokens, like a non-fungible token that you can exchange on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, more or less in this collectibles sense, except it's, it's a program that makes its own art. You, you can almost think of it like, like it's, it's kind of like uh, what an artist and super art platform would be, except it's, it's completely automatic. Um, and it's running on the Ethereum blockchain or something like that. Okay, so those are some of the precursors. Now let's talk about, like, now let's put all the pieces together, right? In the second half of this course, we talked about generative models, right? Generative models are these neural, they're these machine learning models which take a whole lot of data, like lots and lots of pixels, and they can produce data that basically is the imagination of from this data set, this crowdsourced data set, right? So, um, and well, we know the generative models can produce an almost infinite supply of, of graphics and sounds and text and, uh, and, and things that really like capture the imagination of, of the population that produced the data, right? 
Like this is what we think of cats, right? Because this comes from images we've taken of cats that we've labeled of cats, right? And so for me, like it's always, of course, captured that part of my curiosity, which is like it's it's getting inside the collective imagination, in in to to me, right? At least the way I think of it. Um, and uh, and so generative models for me are are a really really necessary piece to this puzzle, right? So now you take this, you combine it with our curation markets idea to create a governance scheme uh, and the market for and the market for the data and the computation and the algorithms that are necessary to produce it, right? So you have a software, you have a software project to implement a generative model um, and you have a market to get data from anybody who wants, right? That can, they can then be paid. It can be trained in a decentralized manner using something like the Open Mind Protocol. And now you have basically, it's basically a decentralized autonomous organization which implements a generative model trained on data, which is data and code, which is assembled by a curation market, which is also serves its governance structure. So the data doesn't come, it's not like rewards when it sells for a lot of money, it's like what the people who own the, basically are, decide to train it on. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, and you can, and you know, whoever contributes to data, they can license their data, right? So they can be paid in a native token, right? So basically the artist, the DAO, sells art and it it keeps the revenue from the art. It sells it to you know, whoever wants to buy it and then it uses that money to pay for the data, right? It, to train the model, right? To pay the users for the bounty, bounties for the, their data and for computational resources and everything else it needs, right? To actually train it. And it has to, probably has to pay the developers as well. Well, that's not clear, maybe. Maybe the developers might just develop it in the way that they've developed Bitcoin, uh, essentially for free. But um, but it would make sense for that to be also an aspect of it. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of permutations that this could take on. Um, but the point is that basically it's an artist in the cloud. It's an ar a true artist in the cloud producing infinite varieties of you know your paintings and and uh, you know cat memes and. Basically, like I mentioned Numerai earlier, like the idea to be the world's, um, the world's hedge fund. And I think this could be the world's artist. Like this will take every, all the pixels in the world. Um, all of them. Like. It's interesting that it's not actually like, fully autonomous in a certain way, right? Like I mean, you have to give life to it, right? You can yeah, take yeah. its life away. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you can liquidate. Yeah, yeah. And you can influence it through yeah, yeah. duration. That's true about you right. and me too. No, it's it? true. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing about autonomous. It doesn't mean that you live on an island. Right. We're all influenced by each other. But the point is that we're independent beings that, that exert, that, that are ultimately not turned on or off by, you know, um, by a switch of a button, let's say. So this is, this is the, uh, well, yeah, that's the, that's the basic ar archetype of the, of, the, <coughs> of the idea. It's relying on all the latest and you know, greatest technologies in, in the AI and the decentralization space. It's definitely coming, in my opinion. I don't, I don't know if this will be it, but I'm, I'm very interested in pursuing it. There's, a, like I said, there's a number of projects in the space, and there's a lot of, not a lot of, but there's a small corner of the internet that's discussing this idea actively. And, um, and for me, there, there's, there's also, there's another motivation to it. It's not just because I want to make an artist in the cloud, although I do want to do that, but also because it's a really great vehicle as art tends to be, to explore futuristic concepts that are probably coming. And uh, it's a very low stakes environment, right? At the end of the day, like the worst thing you could do is make ugly art. Um, but, but these kinds of systems are probably going to be governing much more important aspects of people's lives in the future. And so maybe this is kind of a way to explore the mechanics of this, of these types of technologies through, you know, an artistic medium. So that is the autonomous artist, and that's that's the basic idea. Um, yeah. So, um, are there first of all, are there any questions or comments? I've been droning on, and oh wow, it's, we just made it. It's just perfectly on time. It's three oh five. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Is there already a lot of great commentary? Like yeah, uh, So the artist provides data, or sorry, people provide data in the environment, and you said tokens. And then also the uh, location. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and 
What about the models to the, say, blockchain? Who's updating it? Who, so who's updating it? It's probably updated in some smart contract, I suppose. Um, it can update itself too. At some point. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that's that's what the Open Mind protocol is trying to achieve, like a, a framework for doing that. The way Open Mind describes it is, it's more of still a value proposition for a company to put their uh, to make a machine learning model and have it shared essentially, or, or not shared, but but. Um, make guarantees of the kind that we mentioned. But in theory, and this, this I'm still not sure about, and I actually asked it on the Open Mind Forum, and I got mixed, mixed responses, but it seems like it feasible in principle, is that you can, like, what if, what if AI Incorporated is the users? Basically, you have a way that a population of people can actually collaborate on the model together without any central creator of the model. Um, and there's all sorts of interest, like cryptographic schemes that can enforce that because, of course, the model is very valuable. So how do you prevent it from being um, used? And there's all uh, or copied or you know stolen. There's all these like secret sharing schemes that exist in cryptography that allow people to share a valuable resource together. Like you know you can think of like uh, multi multi signature and all these other te technologies. I'm in the early stages of researching all that myself, so I, I don't have concrete answers. But it seems in principle. Feasible. Yeah. Any others? Uh, so this is what this all of this was leading to. Yeah, that that sort of that one mic drop. Like the, yeah. So um, I, uh, this is my my only AI class uh, that I take mm -hmm. at ITP. But um, everyone now is sort of talking about. I, Elon Musk just had a, a interview with Axios recently, and he was talking about how the, the AI forms an existential threat. And I, I haven't seen anything existentially threatening, uh, at least in this class and in anything else I've read, that isn't trying to be sensationalist in, in the way that they're talking about it. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are as somebody who's, who's involved in, in the AI community and whether you think that also yeah. existentially we should be concerned. Or yeah, I mean, uh, well, okay, like a lot of what Elon Musk says is a little bit like hard to take seriously because because he's he's a bit of a hand flailing type. Definitely, there's like like there is a non-zero chance of existential threat. Like I believe that's definitely like reasonable to to believe, but it's probably far away. Like first of all, these AIs are like not that smart yet, and and they're not actually that autonomous yet. And so we'll have plenty of time to like address existential threat. Like there's obviously a lot more like low-hanging fruit. Of course, like machine learning models are like uh, being used for criminal prediction or criminality assessment. They're bank uh, loan assessment and all these other things that are probably much more like pertinent now. And uh, as far as existential threat goes, it's like it, things never look the way that we we really imagine them like, you know, in, into the far past. It's, it's good that people are studying it. Like I think there's there's definitely like good reasons to, to study, study it, but it's so hard to make projections into the far future. So it's something that I mostly stay away from. I mean, I'm glad some people are doing it. Definitely like, definitely like um, low hanging fruit first. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the answer to your Skynet question. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, next week presentations, right? So, um, like I said, like uh, tomorrow. Thursday uh, and Monday are great days to, to visit me, and, and if you want to submit uh, next Friday, you can do that as well. And uh, this Friday, I'm, I'm not here unless, unless someone really needs me to, because um, I have to leave in the early afternoon. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's about all. Are there any other questions? Okay, great. See you guys next week. <laughs>